we we uh, these these program on the, the use of drones in disaster management is quite unique and we have a lot of knowledge which are being shared and uh, over the last uh, you know two days a lot of presentations which have come forward so it's really wonderful to you know hope we done even today you know uh, we have a series of you know uh, esteemed speakers uh, who are who will speak on different different aspects so we look forward to hear uh, you know the presentation so uh, absolutely absolutely manak yeah so uh, i think uh, we're close to uh, the the starting time we can have a quick check with uh, Professor Chandan Bosch, whether he's around yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Rubab as well, I guess. Yeah, Varun, one more. Can you check with Rubab? Okay. Yeah, Manak ji. Good afternoon, Dr. Ghosh. Good afternoon. I have yeah. a slight bandwidth issue today, so I will just. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, please, uh, take care, take care. And I yeah. don't want to, you know, uh, start something and then uh, okay. if it uh, cracks. So, okay. Good afternoon, okay. sir. Okay, good afternoon. Very yeah. good afternoon. Wait right. for so two minutes until all the participants let their be joined. Huh? Yes, yes, and yes. Just
Ladies and gentlemen, please bear with us for a few more minutes. We shall have the first speaker uh, join us momentarily. Uh, I'm sure Manak is uh, trying to connect. The first speaker of the day. There was some technical issue uh, initially. Uh, Rubab, I, I think uh, I, I was locked out because of the internet connectivity issue. Uh, my internet has gone down, so I am connecting uh, in my 4G connection now. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it is a bit un unstable here. So, uh, no worries. No worries. I think as uh, good, good afternoon, Rubab. Uh, I think you know our our one of the speaker is facing some technical problem in joining. So. You will join soon. Okay. Is it is it uh, Professor Lohani? Um, no, it is a second speaker, Mr. Rajbir. Okay. So we we are starting the day with Mr. Lohani's uh, presentation. Is it? Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm letting you know within one minute. Yeah. Rajbir is here. Good afternoon, Rajbir RTG. Very good afternoon. Welcome to the platform. He has able to join in. Okay. I think I think Devipur yesterday also General Bhardwaj. Uh, I think he was he got uh, stuck in the participation participants uh, list, and uh, we couldn't connect with him, so he we could not be promoted. Although he was listening to what we were saying, but his phone was uh, uh, his battery had conged off, so he was logged in and was in the participants. I wish he had told us we could have, you know, got it promoted. So good afternoon, Mr. Majumdar, Mrs. Sood. So finally, I was able to crack the problem. So uh, hope yes. I am audible. So yes, you are loud and clear. Welcome, okay. Rajiv. Thank, thank you so Very much. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon. Yeah. And thanks, Mr. Majumdar, for the technical guidance in between. So thank you so much. Yeah, welcome, welcome. I think uh, it was basically Akhil Gupta who has given you the, you know, uh, thing. But anyway, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, you know, and many times, like you know, our laptops have several firewalls and uh, and and a different version of WebEx which are available. So sometimes ah. they are blocked. So, but quite possible. Very good but, afternoon, Mr. Sarad Das. Thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, today afternoon. Yeah. No, Namaskar, yeah. sir. Thank you so much for all your joining us today. Thank you so much for all your support and your encouraging words. And also special thanks to Rajbir um, and of course uh, uh, Bayer Crop Science Limited for uh, supporting this online training program uh, as one of the sponsors. Uh, like uh, uh, Government of Tripura is also supporting uh, uh, this particular initiative, uh, which was jointly organized by NIDM and Fiki CIDM board. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Sudh, one of the challenge I can see is that I can, uh, you know, the icons for mute, start video are functional, but the share button is disabled. I don't know. Yes, so, uh, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Mr. Ratim, once uh, you will assign the rights to you, Okay, got it. Thank you so much. I thought I'll just check up with you. Thank yes, you. Yes, so Akhil has the control, so he would he would share those uh, sharing Perfect. rights. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Alok Mukherjee. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us third straight day. Thank you for sparing time and being with us.
Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let us. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, Rati Saab has joined. Okay. Oh, Mukherjee Saab has joined. What about? Uh, hello. Yes, Doctor Gosh. So, uh, uh, we are just waiting for Professor Lohani. Uh, I think Manak is in touch with him. Okay. To connect. Plus, we have uh, Mr. Sanandas also with us. So is Sunanda. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Mukherjee. Uh, let me check. Uh, of course, Rajbir. Yes, John. Ah, oh, yes, John. Yeah, yeah. And Sunandan is always there. And then, uh, let me check. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, let me check that what is the problem. I have made a WhatsApp also. He was on a tour. I was told, but. Oh, ho. I have a vaccination today, 2 p.m. onwards, going there. So uh, let us start uh, with uh, Rajvich. Yes, uh, we can do that. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. I will start with Mr. Rajvir uh, S. Rati, the Director of Public Affairs, Science and Sustainability at Bayer of Science Limited. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you who are present. And uh, the number is growing as we see. We already crossed the 140 mark. In fact, uh, uh, thank you so much. I would uh, take this opportunity to also extend my uh, special thanks and gratitude to Bayer Crop Science Limited for their support in organizing this online training program. Uh, uh, thank you so much for stepping up. Uh, you know, in partnership with NIDM and CIDM Board of FICI to, to organize this initiative, uh, which is, uh, as we all know, is in partnership with uh, the government of Tripura. So on that note, without wasting any more, more time, the, the profile of Mr. Rajveer Lati is there, and I would uh, uh, request Akhil, before he shares his, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the rights to share with uh, Mr. Rajveer, uh, we let this uh, screen be for a few five, six, seven, ten, ten seconds, and then we could uh, have Mr. Rajvi take over the screen for his presentation. I hope that's fine, uh, Rajvi. Perfectly fine, uh, Professor Goswami. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Ghosh, I think we will, uh, because we are already at quarter past two, yeah. so we will let yeah. the Ji start and then we can yeah. have some intervention after his uh, presentation. Yeah. 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 Right. Over to you, Mr. Rati. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, very good afternoon to everyone uh, on, on this uh, session. And the topic chosen is very apt. And while I was having conversation with Mr. Majum, that see what's really expected out of it so that it's become uh, useful, meaningful, and to the expectation of the, all this training. And quickly, uh, you know, I have uh, put together, uh, you know, a slide deck. It's uh, it's uh, eight to ten slides, uh, and I want to, uh, you know, spend a little more time on 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 discussion. And let me know once it uh, comes on the screen. Uh, uh, Mr. Majumdar, is it, is it coming? Yeah, it is visible. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. I just. Uh, Put on the okay. Oops, just a second. Okay, I'll just put up on a, a slide mode. I think it's now better visible. Okay, so what I've done is, uh, you know, uh, based on the discussion with Mr. Majumdar, as I said earlier, and and then the expectation of the uh, uh, for the benefit of of of, of this training, I've just uh, put it together. It's not moving. Just give me a second. 
Yeah, can you see this uh, content slide? So I'll just put up just uh, for the you know benefit of the uh, people on the on the on this training is just to share about uh, you know a couple of things about buyer and our presence uh, in India, and then why there is a need of innovation in agriculture. Uh, we all know what different challenges we are uh, you now facing, and especially in view of uh, I think most of people you might have seen the United Nations mm -hmm. Environment Program recent report, uh, which calls for you know, taking really, really good and pragmatic uh, steps uh, to ensure the food supply is being, uh, you know, retained while uh, maintaining the natural resources and other, uh, you know, key <clears throat> natural, uh, you know, actors and the contributing factors intact. And then uh, coming specific on the uh, new innovative technologies and focusing on drone, that how it can help and, uh, you know, what it is all about. And then a uh, few of the things what uh, you know as bear as a company is doing in india through various uh, and drone partners through various uh, agriculture universities and other institutes so moving forward uh, you know in terms of uh, the corporate history like you know it's uh, globally bear is more than 158 years uh, which started in 1863 in Bhutan, and it has as other organizations uh, <clears throat> bear has also gone through several you know, transformations, the acquisitions and change of the business and, and creating its uh, global footprint. Uh, coming to, you know, the key business areas for us, uh, it's mainly three verticals. One is on the crop science, uh, providing uh, innovative crop, crop care, uh, crop or plant health management solutions, including crop protections. Uh, also, uh, you know, providing high quality uh, genetics and 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 the traits, and of course, digital technology and services are integral part of it to make it a holistic services to the farmers. Uh, in pharmaceutical, uh, we have prescription products for cardiology, women's healthcare, oncology, hematology, ophthalmology, radiology, and and other areas. In consumer health side, it's mainly on the non-prescription medicine in category of dermatology, nutrition supplements, pain, etc., cetera, and etc., cetera, and also in the cold and other areas. Uh, now, just to give a brief of, uh, you know, our uh, commitment and presence uh, in India, we are uh, here in India for more than 25 years. Uh, the first established in 1896 in, in, in Mumbai. And if I can recall, there are uh, very few companies which has been there in India for so long, you know, helping and contributing to the society at large. So just to give you a few snapshots, I'll not read the entire slide, but uh, we are our priorities are fully aligned with the national objectives like you know doubling farmer income how we empower human capital make in india of course and access to the innovation health solutions and of course advancing the digital uh, you know footprint uh, in terms of make in india and for the world we do have our own six manufacturing sites and three research and development breeding center across india and we do have a you know a manufacturing site at wapi which is uh, you know providing the global sourcing both raw material and the finished goods so it fits well into make in india then we uh, do have the innovation and shared services across uh, plant breeding and the innovation around uh, uh, around 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 the healthcare products uh, also you know uh, having strong footprint in the public health uh, through professional pest control uh, controlling mosquitoes termites and other things we do have you know a lot of shared services or innovation hubs like or uh, with center of excellence in mumbai and bangalore especially for ithr and finance it's basically uh, you know <clears throat> uh, what we call is a back end services over here including both in the pharma uh, too uh, besides uh, uh, crop protection and, and the seed side of it and of course uh, if you look at we have more than 13000 you know direct and direct uh, employees across india so so is that the uh, you know, <clears throat> a little bit, I thought I'll just share about uh, peer presence in India. Now, moving forward, like, you know, if we look at uh, uh, today's uh, scenario where we are, I try to put up, uh, you know, a very high level, uh, you know, snapshot, which will, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, lead us to why we need more innovations and, and technologies like drawn and in, in, in agriculture. So if you look at, you know, demand and supply, like, you know, the way we expect that uh, demand for food and feed will definitely increase, population will increase, and of course the uh, uh, need of more uh, meat in the developing nations. But how to, you know, you know, make it, uh, you know, <clears throat> to the demand and and the 
constraint we see on the supply side that uh, we will end up losing close to 17% harvest losses like, you know, because of biotic and abiotic factors. Of course, uh, we all know that there is a land degradation and then as per the, uh, you know, the FAO, it's around 12 million hectares of agricultural land which is being lost annually. Uh, what it means is that how we uh, how we think of new innovative ways, how we deploy more efficient technologies, and of course, in a much more collaborative manner, because there are a lot of stakeholders which has their own competencies, set up their own prisons, and I think it's time of to to, to collaborate to really uh, you know mitigate or find solutions to to, <clears throat> to 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 see that how the some of these challenges on the supply side can be can can be addressed. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, uh, and I think this is important, the, the smallholders, uh, uh, you know, farmer either in Asia or in Africa, uh, they are going to feed the world. And these people, they face multiple pain, pain points across the value chain, either it's within the farm when it comes to, uh, you know, making a decision on crop and seed, preparing soil, growing the crop and harvesting. So they go through multiple pain points and it doesn't stop over here. Once it is being harvested, then there are a lot of you know other challenges uh, after the farm gate. Either it's transportation, storage, sales, processing, and wholesale prices. And if you look at the green thing, I think that's where some of these interventions are being needed uh, uh, or improving uh, to to address some of these challenges within the farm and after the farm gate. But if I can you know summarize broadly in in, in five. Uh, uh, points like you know what are the key challenges like you know which are uh, 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 they're currently standing in front <clears throat> front 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 of all of us uh, either as a government as a policymaker as a, uh, as, a, as, a as a as a regulator as a as a as a as a extension services or as an as an industry that how it can be mitigated one of course uh, there is a lack of fair viable sustainable financing sources and you might have seen that there are a lot of uh, not so good news coming out you know in various part of the country where we hear uh, <clears throat> not so good news around the finance availability to the farmer store when it is most needed of course uh, we are in some of the crops uh, there are challenges of low productivity and profitability we have we have seen it and there is a need that how we can address of course the third one is key that how we provide access to new technology and the resources uh, to the farmers to make it more profitable. Stable market, of course, that's the key uh, uh, beyond producing more, but if there is no mm. stable market, probably it will distort a uh, lot of things and it will definitely, you know, not uh, leading to, you know, providing a remunerative price or profitable price back to the farmer or the producers. And of course, when it comes to the risk mitigation side, the crop insurance, the government has deployed a lot of things, but that need to be further strengthened uh, to, to, to make sure that the agriculture start becoming you know, more profitable on overall basis and in a sustainable manner. Uh, coming back to the specific, I think the topic being assigned, like you know, what would be the key drivers of drone adoption in Asian agriculture system? And I think that's very much common to our Indian agriculture ecosystem. One is, uh, of course, uh, we have seen the land consolidation is going to be there where government is promoting heavily formation of farmer producer organizations. And that's where uh, we need scalable solutions. And that's where drone can play a significant role. I'll move in a clockwise direction and to 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 uh, uh, address the efficiency part of it. And that's where the improved technologies are being needed to 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 lower the overall cost. Uh, on the strong government support, I would like to spend little two, three minutes more, and I would like to thank DGCA, uh, Director General Civil Aviation, uh, which played a crucial role when it comes to providing the SOPs for the drone application in general, and also for the specific purpose. And, and then really in the last six to seven months, they had really worked hard and, and in, a, in a very uh, speedy manner to come out with standard operating procedures which are more practical and pragmatic. And at the same time, Ministry of Agriculture is also working on the guidelines that how the drones can be used uh, uh, you know, uh, for spraying agrochemicals and also uh, deployed for other <laughs> services like uh, uh, you know, uh, pest monitoring, uh, scouting and, and, and remote sensing and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, the technological advancement will definitely lead to increased ease and confidence of its, its, its use going forward. 
Uh, of course, the labor shortage uh, because of several factors of aging, urbanization, and which are demanding more efficient application methods, like you know, which also will will drive the drone application and 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 the adoption. Uh, although it's it's uh, more focused around the disaster management, and I can share an example that. Uh, uh, last year, I think uh, most of the people may be aware that we are, India has seen the heavy locust attack on the western uh, uh, western states in Gujarat, uh, Rajasthan, and Haryana, and that's where quickly uh, DGC and Ministry of Agriculture has exempted use of uh, or allowed the use of uh, you know, drones for its uh, its control. So that's also kind of a nat natural disaster which is just coming up in the form of. Uh, uh, the locust attack like you know which comes once in five to seven years uh, kind of a thing so this is one such thing but but i think there is a need to go beyond uh, you know disasters like the, how to put and deploy uh, the mechanism in place so that at least uh, problems are being addressed and we preemptively or proactively manage the situation where we may not lead to the the, the really bad situation or what we call the disaster uh, kind, kind kind of a situation uh, we have seen, uh, uh, you know, the fall army bomb attack, like you know, in the last uh, three to four years, uh, which has really threatened the sustainable uh, production of uh, maize. Where government of India has really helped in advancing some of the approval of uh, newer chemistries, newer ways of methods of controlling the extension education around it. So these are some of the examples where drone can be really useful uh, uh, to to tackle some of these uh, some of these challenges. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, specific coming to, you know, transforming the mm -hmm. agriculture that how it can be promising. And that's where I want to just highlight, highlight uh, what could be the different broad use of the technology if you look at it. Uh, and it's kind of technology which can be used on all crop stages, either it's spraying, it's dripping, it's granule spreading and etc. Surveillance, of course, that's where the uh, you know, crop estimation can be done, which the data can be used for crop insurance and and then the yield estimation. Uh, spraying, uh, of course, this is really important, and and I'll come to the next slide where the application of uh, either pesticides or fertilizers or other uh, other crop related nutrient uh, substances, which make it more efficient, it makes more effective, and it's also safe use. And 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 it also reduces the uh, operator exposure. Uh, we know that you know uh, nowadays, or most of the smallholders, they use backpack knapsack sprayer, uh, which uh, potentially may not be able to cover uniformly. But but with drone, it provide or lead to the precision application of of, of the uh, of of uh, either pesticides or fertilizer. Sustainability, of course, in terms of a uh, huge amount of water saving, uh, which 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 is which we have seen based on the initial result with the drone, and as I said earlier, it ensures correct load of chemistry, uh, enhancing the socio-economic benefits, and let's not forget the employment because drone application, uh, you know, requires different set of stakeholders: the the operators, the agronomist, mm -hmm. the person who writes the prescriptions, and so on. Uh -huh. So. On data side, uh, definitely, you know, this is something uh, uh, coming back specific to Tripura. If you look at the topography and small holders, that's where it really helped in imaging phenotypical studies, get crop and pest information where the better crop advisory can be, you know, uh, formulated well in advance and, and also, you know, leading to the precision farming. So overall, if you look at, uh, I think, uh, this, this uh, provides uh, the very holistic, uh, you know, benefits when it's, it's, it's being deployed in a proper manner. Now, just uh, you know, this my last concluding slide that how <clears throat> Bayer is, uh, uh, you know, working in this area at a three level. So we are just trying to leverage our global experience and the capabilities in the in the in the rest of the world, and especially taking China and Japan, which has the same kind of land holding and and then and, and the and the other associated uh, challenges. We do have good number of studies on the efficacy and the product safety when it's being used through drone. And in numbers, it's more than 55 products and 16 crops which has been which has been tested. Uh, when it comes to the local research and development and resources, we have identified that there are existing 20 our grants are compatible for drone application. And this is really good news to begin uh, the deployment and, and, and to scale it up to the next level. 
Uh, we did have collaborations with uh, uh, various universities and the research stations for data generation. And only two days back, and thanks to DGCA granting approval to 10 different entities, including us, to do the uh, research trials uh, uh, in, in the captive environment. When I say captive, it's on, on research and development sites, which are approved by uh, uh, the DSIR. Uh, we are also at the same time working on capacity and commercial capability uh, while joining hands with local startups. And we have identified four to five in startups which we are working at different locations. We are also working on various models which will encourage rural employment and entrepreneurship, uh, uh, which uh, which this uh, uh, technology has a huge potential. And 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 of course, uh, as I said, that while working with the university and research stations for data generations, we are definitely willing to participate with government to increase technology and adoption at a at, at a farmer level. Uh, so so in conclusion, like you now, so if you look at overall the a uh, snapshot of what this technology can bring in and we as a company is uh, will be very much happy to collaborate and uh, uh, you know work on certain projects with government of tripura based on the, uh, the the knowledge or the <clears throat> capabilities what we have today uh, in terms of uh, 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 either uh, research either capacity building monitoring or sensing uh, as we are doing with other state agriculture universities, which I think needs a separate, uh, uh, you know, discussion with the with, with the with the state government, uh, you know, officials and the stakeholders. So with this, uh, again, thank you so much for providing this opportunity, and 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 and, and I think uh, with this training, probably this open up, uh, uh, you know, the opportunities of collaborations and working together. Because if you look at length and breadth of the company uh, country this is a high time that the all stakeholders come together leverage each other's strength to reduce the turnaround time to uh, reach to the uh, last mile farmer with this thank you so much uh, mr sudan thank you so much for Fiki, for providing us an opportunity Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very brief but very very definitive uh, presentation, especially highlighting 125 years of your uh, company's uh, involvement in the agriculture industry, and also highlighting that uh, the aspect crop insurance and also demand and supply with the future need of which 10 billion people that which are projected to be after 70, 80 years from now. And uh, giving a overall coverage of where we are lacking with the current trend, even though uh, lots of technology has come and coming up but uh, we are always in the uh, side that is not able to cope up with the future demand. Even one interesting thing that uh, you have shown that uh, whatever is the meat needed for the people, that uh, that is also very much of short supply. Whereas from the climate science aspect, uh, in you know, in order to get maybe one ton of meat or even whether it may be pork or it may be whatever is edible such thing how much carbon footprinting are there and uh, and similarly it is also related that in order to produce one ton of cement how much extra carbon footprint we are putting now all these things are now available even making steel or even many such uh, things are there uh, they are being related, but then more and more facts are coming up. Really, we are in uncertain uh, currently, as well as for future also. Yeah, Manik. Yeah, I think sir, it was uh, an excellent you know, presentations on the practical side of using drones in the agricultural sector. 
and it was wonderfully brought out how they are using drones and what are the projects they have thought about the best part is that he mentioned you know mr rajbir was mentioning about uh, collaboration and projects you know with government of tripura if like you know it can be uh, uh, something which might be interesting for both the organizations yeah. so that's what the best part in the discussions which comes about you know while we'll discuss a lot of things and uh, there are a lot of collaborations which also takes place which are actually beneficial for uh, all the stakeholders so that's a wonderful presentations which we think uh, you know which which has been brought out by mr rajbir rathi and i think there are one or two questions which are coming up you know and it is very interesting that you know uh, the uh, the questions are there in the chat box and uh, and uh, mr rathi if you can answer one of the questions which has come in the chat box i i just saw it it is like you know uh, it is by mr ashutosh awasti who writes that what is the average cost of drone usage in agricultural use in particular land in prospect in prospective of district administration so uh, uh, can you please uh, answer this question please uh, right and i think uh, that's that's really important question because <clears throat> uh, any new technology i think it's the economics which uh, you know propel or, or or put it other way around so as i said that we are just you know in the experimental stage as of as of as of now but uh, in all sense it has to be competitive but certainly uh, you know the calculations are being going on that how uh, you know it will fit into the overall you know spray cost or overall cost to the farmer over uh, there not just spraying but you know the whole idea is that how you deploy that drone right from the sowing till till, till harvesting so that it becomes more cost effective so this is uh, you know something which is under uh, you know under under calculations and under under experimentation stage so it's difficult to say but what i can say as of now is that it that what we strongly believe is that you know it will be competitive it will be you know advantageous to the farmer when it comes to the holistic services being to be uh, provided by the drone so this much i can say uh, mr majumdar as of now so if if we have to uh, you know add on to this uh, question you know that uh, uh, what do you think is the sustainability in terms of business uh, for drones uh, like organizations which are working on drones you know for these type of sectors like agriculture so uh, how do you think that this model is sustainable or or it will it will escalate to a much greater height you know in the near future so that most of the states uh, uh, can use drones for their agriculture you know like pest control and those things so what 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 is your thought on that so uh, i i want to take a step back and and you know just <clears throat> moving from the traditional mindset of that there is a you know uh, rice crop and there is a farmer who is spraying with backpack sprayers but if you look at uh, uh, you know when it comes to new innovation technologies and to begin with i think uh, what we strongly believe is that it's going to be sustainable because certain crops uh, which are uh you know little higher in the higher in the height like sugarcane plantation crops or the orchards like you know where it's difficult to uh, spray with the other conventional methods because of either safety or exposure i think that's where it will find uh, uh, you know really uh, good usage uh, not just from the perspective of its application but efficient application managing uh, or using the good agriculture practices to 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 manage the risk of uh, of of the residues and we have seen uh, you know a lot, lot of examples where some of the produce get rejected because of either a uh, lot of or 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 residues exceeding the maximum residue residue limits uh, specific to sustainability uh, i think uh, and i not think I, i strongly believe that as i said that it will provide a lot of rural employment and entrepreneurship like you know because it is not just one thing because you need a the pilot to operate it you need an agronomist associated with that you need to have the input providers and 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 these factors certainly contribute that it's going to be sustainable and more so the to begin with either with the orchids uh, the, the 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 plantation crops or the crops like sugarcane and other crops which is difficult to uh, you know cover it with manual spraying either it's fertilizer or it's uh, crop protection uh, solutions Uh, which will definitely uh, be 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 adding to its sustainable use in in the future. And if you look at the example of uh, you know China and Japan, it's quite sustainable and large geographies are being 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 covered uh, covered under the uh, drone application. Okay, that's great. Uh, if I can add you to you know the next question, 
that what is uh, you know what do you think in the next five years the market of drone uh, in terms of business will be i mean in terms of the economy in terms of the gdp i mean what is the amount of you know money which you think that uh, this this will be in terms of business in the next five years uh mr mulimdar if you look at the way you know the work has uh, begun with a lot of support which is coming from uh, you know the various uh, ministries and data generation is there which we expect the commercial thing will begin uh, uh, somewhere end of uh, you know next year uh, the way we are anticipating there could be some potential delays i don't have the figure but uh, uh, you know uh, i i can uh, provide if you give me 5 to 10 minutes i have just noted down in some of my my notes and maybe i can put up in the chat box if you uh, allow me to do so during the course of conversation in the next half an hour also great and uh, if 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 rubab is there uh, i uh, 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 uh i can request rubab to give his comments about uh, the presentation uh, i think uh, there must be some technical problem at his side so may i request akhil gupta to kindly you know say some some points you know what what is your thoughts on uh, your thoughts on the presentation on the role of drones in disaster management from the uh, yes manu rubab is not here i guess he is facing some technical Yes, I think it was an excellent uh, presentation by Mr. Rathi, and uh, as he pointed out, the precision uh, agriculture practice practices uh, are really helping the farmers to make informed decisions. Uh, and you know, these practices are evolving, are still evolving. Uh, as you asked Mr. Rathi about uh, the global market, I was reading an article uh, online, and it says that the global uh, market now estimated to reach. 43.4 billion dollars uh, by 2025 this is the market for precision agriculture practices uh, while drones also known as unmanned aerial vehicles have not yet made into the mainstream agriculture space yet they are playing an increasingly important role in precision farming helping agriculture professionals lead the way with sustainable farming practices while also protecting and increasing the uh, profitability so yes, so it, certainly it has a huge huge application and usage in the years to come and Uh, i must say that you know uh, from mr rathi side it was an excellent presentation and uh, we look forward to uh, you know working with buyer more closely and uh, for a deeper engagement uh, uh, in 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 time to times to come thank you mr rathi okay that uh, that that really wonderful may i request the participants to please type in your questions in the chat box so that the speaker can answer to you uh, you know either in the chat box or or if they are available here so uh, so i would request the participants to kindly you know type your questions you know whatever questions you have in the chat box uh, now may i request you know uh, channel sir to you know uh, kindly give his remark uh, so that we can go on to the next presentation uh, uh, if you agree uh, uh, channel sir are you there yeah yeah so yeah can i can i can i you know uh, uh, can we uh, 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 can we have your final remarks So uh, that we can go to the next presentation. One chat box recently, Ashutosh Awasthi, uh, the sir, drone uses both niche software, hardware, and infrastructure, and human resources development. And what are possible ways to fastening the process? Uh, in this case, without directly uh, replying this, I think I would rather say in the other way that uh, we don't, we do not need to. Worry about uh, so software, hardware. Yesterday's presentation, you have seen one from Sivatsan and another from uh, NIT, uh, Sivatkal. Uh, you see that uh, they have spent up. Uh, I think Professor Ganga Dharan, uh, who is the heading their Center for System Design uh, there in NIT, uh, Sivatkal. Uh, we are conversing after the session yesterday that they have spent up about. Three crore in acquiring all uh, that lidar camera, handheld camera, and surveillance system that they have brought in. So three crore is nothing uh, compared to that the kind of uh, uh, things that they are giving. So in that case, uh, as as far as software uh, and hardware is concerned, there are we don't worry about. Uh, now flooding with our mobile phone market every day new mobile phone is coming 
so manufacturing vlsi system are such that uh, they uh, when market requirement for mobile phone may be 10 they are making showing available in the market in more than 100 because they know that uh, the market trend is such that manufacturing quality is such that and it is we need not to worry about those software hardware already sivatsan and uh, Raj, they have shown that using this drone uh, what kind of software that they have customized to the requirement of the public taking permission automatic permission like yesterday so uh, embedding whatever rules and regulation where to fly and and also uh, dr mukherjee was uh, also interacting with sivatsan that uh, military application is different but military application or civil application crop application these are already tremendous uh, these are developed and it doesn't cost much compared to what we get from this application because when tractor came in the market from the card uh, 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 say buffalo or cow driven uh, tractor uh, this uh, uh, plow system to tractor one tractor is equivalent to i think uh, mr rathi would be telling that how much equivalent work it, it can does it can do uh, or it has been doing for so many years and india is uh, how much imp important it has given so in that way the technology development and application is concerned uh, and then training part that which you are mentioning I think uh, training part, our resource institution like NIT, IIT, they are always there and many training institutes are there and many organizations now, they are giving training on drones. So that also uh, becomes very easy because Srivatsan, when he did, if I recall, it is only switching off, switching on, that's all, nothing else is required. Uh, the rest of the thing, the software is being taken care of. Taken care of. So, uh, fastening of the process uh, which you said it is already first only thing our regulation rules these are still to be streamlined to the proper uses ethical uses uh, which uh, mr mukherjee was uh, used, uh, telling about yesterday so ethical aspect is also there so system is already there and the drones are now given as a uh, birthday gift or something like in the countries like usa or uh, korea or some other places very soon we will be also having only we are still in the grip of licensing and enforcing whatever uh, rules regulation that which is being formulated so uh, it is uh, like uh, yesterday showed that 300 water project dam or uh, the embankment that they have so state government has got certain certain jurisdiction to run their drone and collect those information and then make, give a customized data to them so that they work more efficiently. Of course, in this matter, I, I think uh, Mr. Mukherjee, I can say he can say something. Um, uh, I I had a i had a little bit of a different kind of a question actually i put it up privately to him but anyway it's a okay. question to everyone i mean okay. uh, it's not my direct area but it really is a very enlightening to know that it has got such a lot of usage in the agriculture sector which probably i i had not given my thought fully uh, yes i was reading around a bit but then it brings about a new uh, question in my mind that you know this we don't have to open startup only in the cities. I mean, you can have startup coming up in entire two cities and or in, in smaller towns where the investment in a drone is very, very less to start a company. So uh, you, you invest in a drone and you offer the services to local, uh, to local farmers or big farmers probably in the beginning who can afford it. Who You go and, you go and offer the services to spray his field and come back at a small charge. And... Uh, I do not know whether buyer is helping in uh, this kind of an effort to identify, uh, like for example, you know the the Nasik where all the uh, grapes are grown, where it's at a at a height where you it would be it would be uh, much better to use a drone to uh, you know to spray. So identifying mm -hmm. such areas uh, is buyer doing something like that I had a question for uh, Mr. Rati. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Mr. Alok, uh, thanks so much. Uh, sorry, Dr. Alok. 
uh, you're right. And we as a company, you know, are having a, you know, our, our presence is at the local area close to the farm gate. That's number one. And we do have a lot of, uh, you know, local, you know, entrepreneurship projects like more than 500 or so, what we call better life initiatives, where we encourage the rural youth in terms of helping them uh, to open up these service centers, uh, providing seeds, pesticide fertilizers, not just standalone, but also working with our partners, uh, like, you know, from irrigation, we have NetFM, we have Yara fertilizers, from finance, we have, uh, you know, tie up with the Access Bank. And that's where we see, like, you know, uh, to to extend or just to improve the addition of drone services uh, with them, but as you know that this is uh, uh, it, it's a machine which needs uh, services and other paraphernalia which is there. But certainly that is that is on our priority because drone has to be close to this uh, area of an operations. So every time drone provider cannot move from cities, maybe you know urban or semi semi urban areas. So that has to be a cluster based approach. Like you know if one drone can cover five to six villages based on the nature of crop based on the either it's rubby or uh, you know the, the the curry crop so based on the based on the need and that is very much on 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 the radar and that's where we are just working with the uh, our partners to identify the, the rural youth youth who would be really interested in that and we do have certain lot of centers and we are expanding it and 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 if drone has to be successful as you rightly said it has to be in the rural areas it has to be, you know, next to people who really need it. And especially I'm just talking about the farms. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Rajvir Rathi. It was really a wonderful interaction session also, you know, besides the presentation. So thank you, everyone. And uh, let, uh, let me take this opportunity now in welcoming our, you know, next speaker, uh, Mr. Chira from any SAC and he will be presenting on aerial survey by leader and roadmap for disaster managers. So uh, let me give a brief about uh, Mr. Chirag Gupta. Mr. Chirag Gupta is currently working in Northeastern Space Application Center, Department of Space Government of India, Shillong, as a scientist since 2014. So he has completed Bachelor of Engineering Electronics and Communications Engineering from Siddhaganga Institute of Technology, Tumkur. He is working on unmanned aerial vehicle for remote sensing applications. His presentation is focused on aerial survey by leader and roadmap for disasters and disaster managers. So over to you, Mr. Chirag, for your uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. So a very good afternoon to all. So I would just like to correct the uh, topic of the talk, sir. I think it is somehow not changed. I have sent an email. It is based on UAV technology and applications at NSA. So we'll touch upon some disaster management related applications also during that. So I hope that will be OK, sir. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. You can start sharing your screen. Yeah, one second. Yeah, is it visible now? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is just a very broad idea about the presentation. So I will just touch upon what is the introduction to UV technology, not in details, and then some activities what we are doing at NSA and some of the applications what we have carried out with different user agencies in this area. And uh, in the last, uh, I will just touch upon some of the DGCA regulations. So which were as per the Gusty of India document in the month of March. So that's all about the brief overview. So uh, coming to the technology introduction, I think I need not to go in telling the different classification of drones, but since uh, our is a remote sensing application center mostly, and we do deal with satellite imagery. So in that sense, I would like to introduce drones and it is really a very uh, upper hand when it comes to the difficult terrain like us. So 
all of you might be aware northeast uh, being the all uh, seven sister states consist of lot of hill area and the weather is mostly uh, foggy over here so in that scenario drones are really helpful and we found it is very much useful for a, a small pocket of surveying and very quick uh, deployment uh, purpose so uh, we have been using it last four five years and we could see uh, many differences and we use in uh, urban planning or disaster management agricultural mapping precision farming surveillance so many places uh, we are already using it so first i will just tell some brief application what is all the possible applications of course it is not limited to so i think other people have also touched upon one is the land surveying so you can see this 2d map it is uh, the map generated by us only in the town nongko town area in the meghalaya state so like this we can generate many of uh, 2d maps and terrain maps even gis analysis so this is one of the major uh, social related society related application i would rather say uh, not into the different side so another is the agriculture so we can see uh, left side you can see the crop monitoring so we can monitor the disease insects weed crop progress crop stress so we are doing some of the experiments with icr also i'll uh, come up later and then fertilizer or pesticide applications then uh, drainage issues and yield estimation so all those things are possible using the drones in the field of agriculture then uh, another domain we can say is the environmental science studies so we can do use it very much in forest areas so uh, for forest fire and deforestation issues then we can monitor river bank erosions and people are also using it for animal counting so even though there are some uh, discrepancies but it is in use and forest also one more important application is boundary mapping so that that is also a, a good example in the use of forest areas so coming to the civil engineering part we have different kind of inspections so maybe inspection of bridge cell phone towers power lines solar panels and then uh, transportation route feasibility survey in case of mining we can think of uh, volume calculation volume estimation for open mine areas so volume estimation related work also we have carried out to some of the places and next comes to the disaster management so we can see like relief and rescue is the major uh, thing we can do at the time of disaster then fire fighting drones surveillance and monitoring of course so during disaster and post disaster also and this is the another very important uh, area we feel supply of medical services so even we are in touch with some of the uh, hospitals over here who are interested to carry out because this is a hill area and lot of demand is there so uh, to travel a, a small place like to come up to the city for the remotest people it takes around 4 to 5 hours of walking sometimes they used to trek for 4 5 hours to reach so whereas if we try to reach using drones we can reach maybe within 10 15 minutes and our major target was uh, for the location is specific so uh, snake venom is a, like snake bite is a very popular uh, accident here so many people face every year in Meghalaya. so we planned for that uh, dropping of anti snake venom tablets because their uh, time is the treatment so if people are reaching late to the hospital it becomes difficult to treat otherwise a small tablet can survive the people so on those lines uh, developments are there and it's another important field i guess so and this was all some brief activities of drones. So now I'll tell what we are doing at NSA. So our major work is divided into four focus areas. So one is the 
UAV system development. So here we have almost more than six survey grade UAVs along with other experimental drones. We used to do a lot of assembly and uh, improvements in the existing drone system to do different, uh, what we say, experiments. So, and we have some RGB cameras, multi-spectral cameras and hyperspectral also we have taken up now. So those are the different kind of payloads. Uh, another is the data processing facility. We have a good team of uh, uh, UAV data processing and photogrammetry, and we are having almost many uh, softwares for that fix 4 d mapper or AGI soft pro to do end-to-end -end data processing. So we not only do the initial processing, uh, later on our thematic teams are doing some analysis on top of that. And next is the UAV services. So we are also providing uh, UAV services to other user line departments of various uh, planning and development activities in the northeastern region mostly. And uh, we have conducted many surveys for different departments over here. And another is the technological support to other departments. So in one of the projects, we have supported all state remote sensing centers of NER to establish a UAV setup along with the softwares and all and we have provided them a good 15 days training and the continuous support after that. So these are the three, four major areas we are focused on. And uh, so you can see some of the UAV systems we have in the initial time. So uh, some DJI ways also there and we have an assembled hexcopter where we are doing some experiments also because all the commercial available systems, we cannot do much of the experimentation. So to develop that capacity in-house, we are working on that. So this is one of the latest uh, UAV, I must say. It is very much useful for a large area mapping and all. So we have, we have used this in many places of Northeast and the uh, other parts of the country. So if we, we fly it around say four, 500 meter height also, I'm getting around five centimeter uh, resolution on ground using this Sony RX camera. So again, I told like problem is we cannot do much of changes. So you can see here their payload phase is fixed. So we can hardly use two, three uh, payload options are there, but we cannot modify this system to do some other tasks. So in that way, whoever is working in this domain, I think it is a mixture of application or service and then technology development, both hand in hand. If we focus on one area, then it may create uh, in, uh, the imbalance or to cater to the other parts. And then these are some of the sensors what we are having for uh, collecting different UV data. So we have a multi-spectral four-band sensor, MikaSense, and Sinop HSC2 is the latest uh, thing we are having, but uh, we could not do proper experiment till now. So it's a UAV-based platform only, but there is some issues with the registration. So I don't know if somebody is using, you can help me out also. So this sensor uh, we are trying, to, we have mounted on our UAV platform, we have collected nice data. But when we go on for processing, there are some issues with the interband for, for registration. I hope it should be sorted soon. And then we have five band multispectral uh, sensor. Even we have converted it into a dual band sensor. So these are some of the experiments we are doing at any sec. So this is for the payload delivery. So it's uh, related to the same medical uh, payload delivery, you can see we have come uh, gone to a nearby uh, village area, which is little difficult to reach. And then we try to drop a package from a civil hospital to a PHC or CHC center. And people can collect it and immediate relief can be given. So here we have considered hardly, I think up to one kg payload so considering small medicines and all. So the same thing can be upgraded with a higher capacity of drone to get 
a more better uh, payload capacity and drop other components also or sometimes a small medical instruments also can be dropped on to the other place and then the spraying also i was seeing in the last presentation uh, they have come up with a good system so we are also working on the similar line for a spraying mechanism we have tested it for say five liter of a spray so this this mostly we are working with nearby agriculture institutes over here to just have on, uh, on research mode so what is the how much is the effectiveness of the system on the ground so those studies we wanted to conduct slowly and this is one more experiment uh, this is we are doing with indian institute of sciences bangalore so oh, idea here is we want to collect the water sample at a certain interval in a big river or say so to monitor the pollution level so here we are planning to develop a amphibious kind of uav which can land and take off from water and it can uh, probe it into the river depth maybe say 5 centimeter or 10 centimeter or half a meter based on the requirement and collect certain amount of water sample maybe 100 ml or 500 ml based on what are all the parameters we need to check so this project is also going on i hope and very soon we will be demonstrating it so apart from this we have a in-house 3d printer over here so it caters with different materials pla nylon abs so 3d printing is basically used for uh, preparing different uh, support components for our drone and even some small amount of repair also possible so down you are seeing it is a small quadcopter what our team uh, made from the scratch the so full design is made from the scratch we printed it part by part and then we come up with the uh, complete drone and it's uh, really flying good so our only concern is since we are uh, pitching up for more of uh, make in india components but uh, i don't find till now many of the uh, comp electronics components used in the drone uh, frame we are getting anyhow we can make ourselves or in market also so I would really like to see some of the uh, companies or vendors to come up with uh, say propeller designs or copter uh, this motor designs. So as far as my experience propeller designing also it's feasible we tried with our 3D printer. So you can see over here these are some uh, low noise propellers we have developed at our lab itself. So of course it's not commercial level, so it's still um, we are doing some research work with this. And this is a universal seeding mechanism kind of uh, we have developed with the 3D printer where we can put different dimensions of seed and spray it in the uh, deforested area or in the agriculture field. And it's a prop balancer and sensor mount, so in that way it's very useful. Uh, this polymer based 3d printing what we are having because it's a polymer is very used uh, lightweight and we can use it in very uh, different parts so these are some of the services we are providing to our different user departments and some collaborations at any sec so as i told like uh, we have made uh, all state remote sensing centers uh, we have updated them with uav and softwares and we have signed mous with um, isc bangalore iit kanpur and university and to develop the uh, technology in collaboration and we are doing some more uh, collaborative work with other departments So coming up to the training and capacity building, so Northeast being a remote place, so uh, there are not very much opportunities for the people to get trained and it is a huge demand for training. So we are con we have conducted almost every year since 2016 a two-week CUV remote sensing and data processing course. So people used to come here and get trained on the 
uh, we we data processing and its application and up to some extent we give them a flavor of training but it cannot be a full pilot training uh, just to understand the end to end process we introduce them to the uh, mission planning concepts and uh, autonomous flying or even manual flying so so that they get a feel of how data is collected if we collect a random data we cannot uh, it cannot be useful for in generating any product so like this uh, we are promoting this technology in this place and uh, what i feel like every year when we open up this course we get more than hundreds of applications even we even if we restrict seats to 2025 so in future i think uh, more people can come up and we may have to uh, conduct it more frequently and then we are also doing some department specific training so like for uh, state remote sensing centers of any sec or uh, sorry uh, ner and then northeastern council officials so those kind of small short trainings also we are providing to the whoever is the interested user so these are more on focused area so somebody want to use it for agriculture only so in that we conduct only for agriculture all the uh, possible projects and all so uh, now i would like to just showcase some of the applications uh, what we have done at any sec and then how it can be related to other fields so uh, this is the large scale land use mapping so you can see here uh, this is the the road is straight it's in onko town actually on the both side of the national highway in the meghalaya town so we can generate uh, more than 27 uh, land use classes over here and the map was submitted to the deputy commissioner office and they are using it for different application then this is another work for estimation of artwork for extension of shillong airport so shillong airport is quite small till now and they are planning for extending it so it has some hillocks nearby so we did some uh, that kind of analysis so how much earth volume to be removed and cut and fill volume analysis the digitalization so those things were done so next is embankment breach location and uh, monitoring in assam so even we can relate it to a disaster management application so after flood or some heavy rainfall this embankment breach how we can stop or how what are the pre measures we can take so this was done in the ranga nadi river of assam so we tried we have gone along the embankment maybe 25 kilometers and capture the right and left bank embankment and generated the cross section profiles and suggested some uh, measures before the rain comes and same thing can be repeated after the rain or flood to assess the dam damage and to do the repair work on the same so again this is a volume estimation of chairport it is somewhere in jammu we have gone for some jammu police special request so here like anything dump on a open ground we can see the volume estimation and verify it so these are some log uh, some illegally transported uh, logs i guess and then we try to estimate how much volume is dumped over there and this is what i was talking about in forest areas so uh, in meghalaya or in many of the other hill states here the forest don't um, all the forest don't belong to the government so many of them are belonging to the communities so that's why we call as community reserve forest and those communities uh, like nobody has surveyed those areas so boundary is not defined so this is uh, this work we have taken up with the the forest department of meghalaya government they wanted to demarcate boundary for community reserve uh, forest areas so uh, here our team has gone to many of the remote places over here and 
conducted the drone survey along with the DGPS and total station survey to precisely demarcate the boundary areas. So next is the again related to the embankment bridge location. This is from the Majuli Island from Assam. So here you can see the difference. So this was a old satellite image or Google Earth image of this location. And on 3rd June, 3rd January 2016, then uh, some after flood, this was the drone image on 21st September 2016. So we can see this breach of embankment and then people uh, try to make some alternate path for the movement. So this kind of analysis, pre and post disaster analysis also can be done by using drones. And you can see a um, lot of detailing in the image. So this is another area uh, application of disaster monitoring. So you can see here this Kopili hydropower dam outburst has happened on the Assam Meghalaya water side. So a huge water pipeline got damaged in between and it's almost devastated entire area. So when many people got stranded and two, three people got uh, death also during that time, and you can see uh, the impact in the nearby uh, nature. So we immediately gone with our drones and we did their surveillance, visual surveillance support to the respective departments uh, to do the rescue and relief measures over there. And this is again the crop damage assessment. So you can uh, also put it, uh, this can be put into agriculture sector and disaster sector both. So uh, this was in uh, Morigon district of Assam. So some crop infestation has happened. This plant uh, brown hopper was there. So mostly they come in uh, blocks and eat up entire fields. So this is this was detected in many locations in Morigon district. So uh, we went there on request of district agriculture officer and we conducted to these many locations and we try to demarcate. And this uh, these details can also be used uh, in the uh, insurance sector. So even this Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana or some other companies, insurance uh, companies related to agriculture sector, they are targeting it this application so it can be clearly demarcated how much crop is completely affected what is partially affected and to settle the compensations claimed by the farmers otherwise there used to be a lot of disputes in that so if we do the drone survey and clearly demarcate the boundaries and calculate affected areas so there will be very less chances of any dispute over here so this is another uh, useful application in agriculture. So this one is the uh, root alignment for construction of new roads. So in this area, uh, like hill areas, conducting a uh, manual survey or conducting a physical survey is very difficult sometimes. So we have taken up a similar task in the Manipur and Nagaland border area. It's a very difficult road and we have to travel by foot many kilometers to do the survey and if you try to bypass this it is a very long route we need to follow so this road we surveyed using satellite data plus drone data both then we try to generate the contour of the road how it should follow what should be the slope and all cut and fill analysis so all those analysis are also possible in all uh, this uh, road development areas So those were some of the applications uh, or some of the survey works what we have done here. So to last, uh, I would like to uh, give some glimpse on DGC regulations. So like every country has come up with some sort of regulations in the drone field. So in our country, DGC is regulating that. So all of us know. So. In the March document, they have come up with a detailed document with a 10, 11 parts to deal with drone from primarily 
and then the development it covers about surveys it covers about traffic management then uh, drone ports also uh, provisions are there then operation and maintenance manufacturing import so all things are uh, there in details so i have just uh, pick out some of the points to highlight here so major is the classification so we must we all must be knowing by now so this was the classification given in very earlier draft of dgca it is coming on so in the latest one what they have added one interesting point is uh, any of the existing class they have added some flight limit and maximum height ceiling so say if a nano category flight limit is set to 15 meter per second and maximum height and range is 15 to 100 meter if it crosses that category even though weight is less than 250 they put it in under micro category so this is a new development uh, that has come up in the uh, last dgca draft sorry last uh, regulations and then uh, flying restrictions are there for micro small and medium micro it has been put up to up to 60 meter height and 25 meter per second speed whereas for small uavs up to 120 meter height and 25 meter per second medium and large we need to get a separate permission from director general uh, regarding the speed and all and uh, then they have given a blanket a thing like no uv cell fly in prohibited areas so all those areas has been demarcated and some uh, some more exercise is going on at different state levels so here also i have seen uh, this state of meghalaya they are trying to market some of the areas as uh, no drone zone so those things are going on even you might uh, i think uh, some people may be aware this green corridor uh, con things also came up in some places where anybody can go and test their drones so these are some of the general requirements so i'll just say like if uh, we are working on nano drones we need not to worry about much of the permissions Whereas micro and above, we need lot of uh, at least unique identification number and operator permit is also required for mini and above. So there one good thing I find out is the model aircraft concept that is MTOW for academic and research institute. So if we are working in your premises, so we don't need to be uh, worry much about the permissions in case of less than two kg systems. then some of the equipment requirements so like id plate or rfid sim for tracking gps module return to home anti collision so lights so these things are there now and for security agencies they have done away with any approval process except intimation to local police and atc then these are some of the no drone zone so i think all of us might know or should know these things uh, since we will be operating in future so important installations like they have put uh, strategic locations state secretariat complex so within three kilometer radius and uh, within five kilometer radius in Vijay Chok, De new delhi that parliament area and three kilometers in the uh, military activities are carried out from there and we have um, beyond 500 meter horizon into sea from coast so these are some of the area uh, and then within 25 kilometer from international border and another important thing is we should not launch it from a moving mobile platform maybe from a vehicle or a ship so these are some of the restrictions that has been imposed by dgca eco sensitive zones and national park wildlife sanctuaries so here uh, i don't know if you can if it is a government project and they need it for a specific purpose some permissions are allowed then within permanent temporary prohibited restricted danger areas so these danger areas has been demarcated by indian air force and airport authority of india 
and uh, sometimes we get a list also otherwise we need to take a prior approval from the nearby airbase or any airport so this is all about the brief activities what we are doing over here so i thank this opportunity to give me the chance to present our activities here so i hand over to the moderator if for any queries related now Well, thank you, Mr. Gupta. It was a wonderful, you know, presentation from your side. And uh, I think it was over. All sir, your voice is breaking, sir. Oh, uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, it is really you have. Uh, Put up the light on the Chirag. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You have, Thank you. You have divulged almost everything about what we have been discussing at our common men's perspective, being in uh, Shillong. And he said, yes. and you have opened up the Pandora box of uh, drone application with uh, uh, with including the last part that about that regulation that which came up in 12th march so the question that which was raised in the previous presentation by avdesh kumarji uh, so i think you have got if uh, you are there uh, that uh, you have got your all answers now clear which uh, uh, we are saying which uh, uh, mr chirag Guptaji has given a entire, including the training that they have been imparting and which is highly rated uh, since 2016 onward. And number of presents are not many, but now online has come, but everything we are moving into online is not also good. Mm -hmm. Someone has to tie the knot, check it, yes. fix it, light, and, and uh, so, that kind of training, of course, due to COVID, is not taking place. But I think with this, uh, with this, uh, that you have 3D printer and you you are having six UAVs are there, and you have shown almost all sorts of not only post disaster, but pre disaster, even uh, estimating the uh, what how much artwork is required. Even you have shown in the beginning that which kind of RGB camera that you have used, which can select or identify even five centimeter in the ground. Even lighter camera can go up to millimeter, but we don't need that millimeter. Five centimeter, 10 centimeter, more than enough. Whereas our area of geo geology mapping, uh, we are still, learning a lot in making one is to 25,000 scale map. Yes. Of course, there, why difficulty is there? There are geo, geology map is very much different from just simply photo or aerial view. In geology, if they want to make from 25,000 scale to 10,000, they have to work a lot because in that scale, they have to identify each and every objects that coming from the parlance of our, our uh, geology, they have to identify their, their, their property, their color, their extent. And there are many geological uh, processes are there which uh, testing is there. Even if they identify a rock is there, that rock hardness, it's, uh, and then it's naming, nomenclature type, and then uh, what are the ages, their classification, everything. So that is why just say, Taking photograph using drone uh, yes, is yes. easy, and especially in disaster management, which you have shown number of example, alignment, uh, which has gone out, then also checking that before and after. So I think uh, your presentation has uh, given uh, such a eye-opening remark that 
in near future what i would say that while uh, smart mobile mobile that now we are carrying i think no training is required rather we get training from our children or many of the grandfathers or grandmother taking things from their grandchildren so things has come to such a extent that now the training and trainer uh, the and the scope that you have opened up and is has opened up uh, really it is fantastic and also the kind of tie up that you are having this i am telling an extra because i have seen that the tie up these days it is a mou collaboration learning and iisc indian institute of science the top class institute of the country having that even the on the day before yesterday uh, mr prusty uh that the kind of post disaster survey uh, cases that they have done in amfan uh, they are also having tie up with iisc and then iit kanpur who started one of the recent one of the most uh, foremost that organization uh, iit kanpur started with drone application and uh, in more than uh, 15 years back so uh, thing is having tie up mou and also you have worked in jammu i was in jammu for <laughs> yes and then uh, checking yes. her and recently something some thing happened in the uh, in the guwahati uh, governor's house which got damaged or some landslide or something hill has moved and then there is a call came to me uh, that whether i can solve the problem i said that yes i can solve the problem provided you are ready to listen to and act accordingly simply taking image is not going to help along yeah, with sure. that we have to be there at least for a weeks time to observe that what has caused those failure and or otherwise it will not work so now with the aerial photograph that we are having it has become more easy uh, for a uh, hardcore civil engineer especially with the structure that you have shown to go into minor and finer details and then visiting the site and revealing that what has caused most of the time like you have shown one of the embankment people have made just there itself they have taken in in uh, one embankment that you have shown people have made alternate route uh, but uh, making the route straight straight and how much time it will it will take what are the operations to be done at the site those are the finer details which you have shown customized also taking figure showing that is not enough but you have been able to give those customized uh, you know output along with the calculation or earth work to be required to the to the finer detail that you have given so i think uh, uh, with so much resources that uh, nsec is having uh, and the kind of uh, Uh, like presentation made yesterday from NITK Suratkal, and they are also looking forward to work together because they uh, Prithviraj uh, he has got a team, and he makes the drone by himself, which you are also doing. So I think when two teams are ready over here, so why not Manakji we uh, take uh, one by one state together? I think Sarat that. Dash is also here, Dr. Sarath Kumar Dash. He was here earlier. I think now uh, I would say that it is just only uh, uh, I would say that it is highly uh, uh, appreciable. And also, you have mentioned which are the electronics item that are not available in the country, but you are able to assemble it, collect it, buy it. Even many of them are available online. and so from our in our young generation and students especially in many of the students in uh, in engineering yeah. colleges or even schools now with the coding class started from the age of 8 8 or 9 10 years so uh, i think we are going to take a tremendous uh, spirit is going to it has been developed here in the drone application and development despite many of the things that we have to still buy because we are we have gone even in the solar solar panel and other things one rupee 99 paisa is the latest rate that quoted in one of the mega project in 
1.99 is the universally no country can able to provide 1.99 per kilowatt hour unit which is cheapest so far mm -hmm. even though we are not having any manufacturing unit of solar panel because we don't have the, any rights or anything so uh, whatever uh, i think you have shown the applications in the, so many areas and you are serving already uh, this adds value to uh, to your contribution i hope that our participants uh, they will be alive enough uh, now uh, to take a drone training and then start some kind of services through your training system uh, training mm -hmm. training whatever it is that let it go to every household so that they can make their living as a trainer and not only that in our civil infrastructure side we know that around 95 lakh bridges are there in railway roads and tunnels are other there. 95 lakh bridges where our bridge, uh, uh, say national highway or state highway authority, even railway, uh, they are not in a position to know their health condition. So at least using the drone and satellite photo together at least a program is being taken up to develop an app that at least we are able to we should identify those bridges along with their position where they are right now and once they are decided then we can go into the mine uh, in the more detailed yes. inspection about their yes, health yes. and amount of work to be done their repairs to be done or projections of their performance or live testing these are all now coming up and in fact um, uh, all india council of technical education has taken up a uh, given a project to send construction industry development council to train 75000 students and they have been uh, students of third year and fourth year of engineering colleges of any branch now you know uh, to target it by another one year when we are completing 75 years of our independence. Uh, 75,000 uh, youngsters will be trained to inspect the bridges where one of the important item is surveillance of those bridges and bringing all those database into our computer system so that we can have comprehensive, you know, uh, uh, bookkeeping of those information and then these trainers who will visit the site physically at least it will take two to three days to know and there are certain formats are available which are made into mobile app so that they can take the video uh, they can uh, take the cracks photographs underground overground so huge program has come up with one of the program that an IDM did with construction industry development calls in just uh, one and a half month back. So program has started already. So with the drone, drone also, uh, when training that you are giving or NITK is there and many other organizations are coming up. And since we are having a lot of uh, memorandum of understanding with the country's center of excellence, and let us bring it from the lab to the application which you are seeing or you are doing for the country. Thank you. Salute to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Actually, there are uh, some comments also which are coming in, you know. Uh, let me read out that uh, by Mr. Srini Nayapathy, who wrote that, sir, the classification of models aircraft is meant for only hobby and recreational purposes as per the understanding between Aero Club of India and DGCA. Uh, and uh, there are application, you know, uh, comments which are coming up. One comment from Ms. Uh, Apriya Bharat uh, Sharma, uh, writing excellent presentation, sir. So I think, you know, all these uh, comments uh, which adds up to the statement what Professor Chandan Ghosh was mentioning that it's a really a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, so uh, with uh, with these, uh, we'll uh, request, uh, you know, uh, uh, the next speaker to come on and uh, and and uh, we'll invite the next speaker to, you know, uh, to give uh, his presentation.
and uh, uh, his name is Dr. Sunandan Datta, and uh, he will be presenting on okay. lightweight robotics for disasters applications in Japan. So uh, uh, let me give a, a, a brief introduction of Mr. Uh, uh, Sunandan Datta. He is working in robotics at the intersection of motion planning, sensor fusion, and control. His work involves motion planning for robots and designing inertial measurement unit based control system for the robot to perform useful tasks in a given unpredictable environment. He is very passionate about the extracting the robot dynamics from measurements by inertial sensors, which emphasize on the interaction between robot and the environment. So over to you, uh, Dr. Datta, for your presentation. Dr. Datta, please. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. OK, thank you, sir. So I share my presentation. <clears throat> Is the presentation visible? Yes, it is this. Yes. OK. So good afternoon, respected dignitaries and. Other participants, thank you for this opportunity. I am Dr. Shunandan Datto. I'm a researcher at HiSIMS Research Center in Hiroshima University, Japan. So I'll present my research experiences from Japan, which is basically the application of lightweight robotics uh, to disaster applications. So the presentation is basically twofolded, like to, uh, it's divided into two parts. The first part is the experiences from the research and what I have experienced in uh, Japan working on lightweight humanoid robots specifically. And uh, uh, till now we have been uh, listening to a lot of discussions on uh, drones and unmanned vehicles, but uh, I will keep it a little bit uh, away from drones uh, to a different kind of robot, different type of robot, which is a humanoid robot, which it looks like a human being. It can be a heavy weight humanoid robot or it can be a lightweight humanoid robot. The basic two classifications. And then I will briefly touch upon the robotics competitions in Japan, which I participated and somehow sometimes I just I became an like uh, observer kind of thing. And at the end, there in the second part is uh, I will share. I'd like to share two case studies which I've been doing myself. It's a personal case study, you can say, uh, on Tripura. And at the end, I will conclude my with my remarks. So the timeline of a disaster can be divided into three basic parts. The first part is the inspection and prevention in which we use different types of robots, for example, aerial robots and serpentine robots, licked robots, and we use them for inspection of different uh, mechanical structures and civil structures. Uh, but after the disaster outbreak, when there is a sudden re uh, requirement of survey and rescue, that means we need robots for information gathering. Of course, many years ago when we used to use human beings or human task force for information gathering, but with the advent of all these different kinds of robots, especially aerial robots and serpentine robots, uh, we are using them for survey. And some some point of time, we are also using them for rescue. But uh, there is a, a slight uh, important thing to note here that we don't use much of the legged robots for rescue operations or information gathering because after the disaster, the environment changes a lot. There is a destruction of properties and it changes the uh, the surface profile, it changes the uh, topography of the surface and the environment. So it's difficult to use the legged robot. So I focus on the controls and the dynamics of the legged robot in this case. And of course, the third part being the rescue uh, recovery, which is uh, done mostly by the defense force and the construction workers who help us to rebuild our structures. And the rescue part, which is highlighted, but mostly it is done by the firefighters and the local police and task force. That means we use mostly human resource for this operation. 
But here it's a slight thread is important to note that uh, they are taking their life and they are at risk when they are doing this operation. So we have to think about that for uh, while working on different kinds of information gathering. Like if we can replace some kind of firefighters with uh, some kind of robot or different kind of legged robot, it can be aerial robot. Of course, the aerial robot came into being for uh, different kinds of, uh, like for example, in case of firefighting like uh, aerial robots. Now, for example, the structure inspection. So I briefly touch upon the pre-disaster scenario, we use the aerial robots largely for the structure inspection where the health monitoring of different civil and mechanical structures are monitored by aerial robots. And for example, for the plant inspection, we use it uh, for different kinds of industrial environments. For example, this picture is from a World Robotics Challenge or a competition in which the robots which are being developed in the industry level and also in the universities <coughs> So we, sorry, we share those uh, robots and we just uh, simulate an environment uh, like an industry and we use the robots to uh, operate or manipulate or different kinds of tasks. So the robots are given different challenging tasks and we uh, analyze the performance of the robots on in this in that regards. So in, in details, I will discuss later uh, half of this presentation, how this uh, different aspects of this present uh, different uh, competitions, robotics competitions, which are around uh, the wo world and also in Japan. Legged robot inspection, as I have said in the timeline slide, that uh, it's difficult because the extreme environments, because when we are talking about legged robots, that means it's having legged uh, legs to uh, go through the different kinds of surface profiles and depending upon the inclination, the narrowness and the unevenness, which is shown in the left side of the slide, we can see the total environment can be classified in three dimension. And uh, based on different kind of uh, surface profiles, a combination of inclination, unevenness and narrowness, a robot can be used, but it's actually under research most of the time. And uh, of course, you can see on the right hand side, it's a Waseda rescuer from Waseda University, which has been deployed a lot into different kinds of earthquake disasters and scenarios. It has been simulated for those uh, scenarios and uh, also uh, different challenges are faced uh, while working on this uh, robots and on, on working on this type of environments. Now, revisiting the timeline again, we can see that legged robot is not so much used as we have seen, uh, as we have used in, in the case of other robots. For example, information gathering, we use the legged robots, but it's only for very much simulated case, whereas for the aerial robots or the serpentine robots, which is a very different kind of robot, uh, they are used a lot uh, for information gathering, whether someone is trapped inside a debris of uh, a household. These are some kinds of the robots which are being used and also have been used for the Fukushima nuclear uh, plant, power plant after the nuclear power plant was hit by the earthquake. And there are various robots you can see, the mostly the rovers and there is a snake robot and also a quadruped robot. And it's mainly for removing the nuclear debris and gathering data from the chemical environment, which is having high radiation environment. It's difficult to uh, avail those environments, to access those environments for a human being. So, of course, the robots can pose a great advantage in those environments. This is a simulator view from the DARPA Robotics Challenge, where we can see that two humanoid robots are working and they're working in a uh, complex environment in which you can see that uh, there are environments of different surface profiles, for example, inclined surface and their staircases and also the plans there on which they are working. They're working on uh, detection of the chemicals. They're working on manipulation of uh, wheels of uh, like steering wheels so that they can control the chemicals uh, leakages inside the plant. So, the main target behind these challenges of the robotics is that we actually simulate the robot so that they can adapt to different kinds of environments. Now I'll briefly touch upon the lightweight humanoid robot development. So there may be question like, there are of course many kinds of robots, like why humanoid robots we use? The basic feature of humanoid robot as uh, highlighted by Professor Shuji Kajita 
He said that humanoid robots can work in an environment for humans. We create the environment around us and we create basically for our own existence, our own living. So these houses and uh, industries and the offices and the lanes and by lanes and roads, everything is prepared and, manif and constructed by the and designed by human beings. And we always design them for our own existence, our own living. So it's always useful and also time saving to develop any robot which can adapt to those environments rather than making an environment which can adapt to robot. So it's an important thing to note here. That means instead of making environments which can be useful for the robot, we are making robots which can be useful and adapted to the environment. And also there is a mechanical effort reduction. For example, the tools that we use always like, for example, a pen and pencil and everything you uh, like holding a mouse, computer mouse, we always use uh, with our hand. So it's always useful to use the robot hand, for example. So we need not to restructure, redesign those tools uh, when we are making a robot similar to our structure, similar to our sh shape. And also, of course, the human safety is also an important case. On the right hand side, this one is a HRP5P series created, designed and developed by AIST Japan, which can have a payload of, which has a payload of 13 kilogram and a degree of freedom. That means number of actuators of 13. There are various humanoid developments uh, going on currently around the world. And of course, starting from the Boston Dynamics and going to the Honda robots from west to east, we can see various research labs coming up in different time and different uh, way. And they are always working, mostly, most of the time, they are working on a human sized robot. As we can see, they are having a weight of like 100 kilogram, which is very much comparable to a human weight. But in case of a Japan, we see an exception that means they, we are developing and we are making and designing different kinds of robots which are not not like human size which are small in shape and size and we say it lightweight now lightweight there is a designation like it's lesser than two kilogram uh, like lesser uh, uh, comparable to the weight of an infant or a baby of uh, six months or seven months or like that so in that case, the, the development started in Japan in 1973 when it was a human sized robot in Waseda University. So it's Wabot Waseda robot came into being. But after that, the ASIMO came when the industry in a, like came into the picture. And after that, it was a collaboration between industries and the uh, universities when HRP and other robots came into being. But of course, there are many robots which are uh, like the lower row, row, you can see there is the UT Mu, Mighty, UT Mu2, Magnum, and then KHR3HV Lambda robots. These are designed and developed on a personal university scale. And this, they actually, they actually help us to understand the dynamics, to understand the ma basic control systems of a robot, which can be, of course, co uh, like we can, which can be scaled to higher human sized robots. So an application for this lightweight robot is that, for example, if we see into this picture, we can see that there is an, an earthquake or a, an, a disaster which has hit a household and many task force, they assembled around that uh, wrecked structure and they're using for a survey and they're going through a uh, rescue operation. But actually what we know, we don't know sometimes is that uh, what is the whether the structure on which they are standing whether it can actually bear their weight because it's a huge weight you can we can see a lot of people they are uh, gathering around for this operation now they are taking the life and they're taking the risk to stay there to stand there because they can have there can be a further uh, like earthquake after that there can be the structure can be having low payload capacity so it can be further damaged so therefore, if we see the damage patterns of wooden buildings, which is very much prevalent in Japan, we see most of the households, they are damaged in the middle of the row. Like uh, if you can see the left figure, the D3 and the D4 structures in which the first floor is damaged, but the second floor is kept intact. So if someone of human weight is going to the partially damaged first floor of the building, it can further damage the structure. 
so also of course it's a, it's putting the life of the rescuer into risk so after shock effects then structure collapse due to possible high loads it can cause injury to the rescuers it can cause injury to the trapped human life and of course it can cause loss of the variable structures so what we need here is an intelligent locomotion system most of the humanoid robots they are having human sized so we actually came up with this uh, idea with this thing that of course we have to make the humanoid robot but it has to be a low weight so for that it uh, pose it uh, throws many challenges for example it's a huge optimization problem as far as the miniaturization of the actuators mechanical links and sensors and control circuits vision hardware and all these things has to be miniaturized and very very much concise because uh, because it has to be a payload is a big issue in this case so that's how the lightweight humanoid is a big motivation for us and it can be used for the preliminary survey of the disaster affected household and after we know what's the problem of course we can use our task force we can help it can help the task force a lot compared to the present scenario like most of the robots we can see in the right hand side they are human sized so the body mass index of the human uh, of the present robots is very much higher that means uh, in terms of human beings we can say they are very much heavy weight or like overweight robots but uh, compared to lightweight robot like for example K condo khr 3 hv on which i have worked during my phd uh, thesis uh, this is a lightweight robot which is having a weight of around 1.5 kilogram which is uh, lower than 2.2 2 kilogram margin and also it's having a very lower bmi so that means we can use this lightweight robots as a motivation that means uh, we can develop our technologies for them and use them for very preliminary post disaster survey and that means information gathering now the scope and difficulties of course there are many because uh, it's a lightweight so there are some additional problems also that came up like for example vibration and the effect of surface friction and the, of course the static stability being the greatest problem always and uh, in general the biped robots and the other humanoid robots these are always having these pro common problems of nonlinear dynamics and having multiple de uh, degrees of freedom so therefore there is a problem of multivariable systems which has to be solved all the time so it's a computationally efficient software we always need for solving the mechanical uh, joint angles to manipulate any any task uh, this is just going through very fastly about the walking pattern how we design the walking pattern of a humanoid robot we first categorize the humanoid robot uh, and then we analyze the vibration it's just a data so when it becomes inclined surface we see that we have to control the posture and there is an incre increase in the vibration you can see from a b on the left hand side leftmost they are like a for the phi equals to zero degree that means a uh, very flat surface when it goes on increasing the surface inclination increases and the vibration increases so we we, we are always working on these issues of the bipedal work, uh, walking and of course there are problems of surface friction because when it's coming to the disaster point of view we cannot expect the surface to be always plain or very much friendly to our work it can be it can it's totally unpredictable so a surface friction model is also very much important in this case now i, st I talk about the competitions which is uh, very much common in japan so one of the competition which is a kind of a challenge uh, world robot challenge it's with wrc there are four different categories and industrial robotics category and the service robotics disaster robotics and junior robotics uh, industrial robots that means uh, there are various industrial robots which are asked to perform different challenges for example part recognition and grasping fitting and screwing and assembling etc and for example for service robots these are more interesting because it's actually forming the foundation of what we know presently is called human robot interaction like we are making robots but how we interact with those robots that's interesting for example we are you the monitoring of the health of an old person in our house or in a very infant baby how we are using and uh, a, a, like an arena of 
a different uh, type of hobby robots which are also coming up with the service robots in addition to that of course the whatever we are talking about like restroom cleaning challenges then customer interaction we use the robots in different kinds of convenience stores and uh, of course there are like for in the like stock and disposal tasks in any warehouse and personal interaction of course for example we use the robots in for personal interaction for example in airports and other facilities or industrial uh, showrooms. What is interesting about the disaster robot is that there are three categories. One is the planned disaster, tunnel disaster, and there is standard disaster. Planned disaster, of course, the name suggests that it's very much related to the disasters which affect the industrial uh, facilities, for example. It, it, so therefore, the challenges for the robots are like inspection of different kinds of uh, industrial components, and fault detection and emergency response according to the different kinds of situations. And the second one is the tunnel disaster. Like uh, in India, we have been always observing there are many disasters which are affecting the tunnels in the higher uh, Himalayan ranges, higher Himalayan altitudes uh, because of the heavy landslide or heavy earthquake. The tunnels are always blocked and how to get uh, the people trapped inside, how, how to get them, uh, how to rescue them, actually. So it's a huge task for uh, for the task force and, of course, for the robotics teams. I'm sure everyone, many people are working on that, and it's a great uh, work also to work on those very challenging environments because simulations, of course, uh, we focus on the simulation-based work for tunnel disasters, but. Uh, the simulation always doesn't give the real scenario. So the real scenario, it changes a lot when the real disaster hit. So it, that's, a, that's an interesting part of this tunnel disaster. But additionally, of course, the simulation gives us some additional information, like how we can prepare ourselves for possible worst case scenario. The securing path and inspect vehicles and rescue someone who, who is trapped inside the vehicle is also uh, are also some of the challenges which are uh, given to the different kinds of simulation scenario. And then the third one, which is a standard disasters, like for example, uh, in case of an earthquake hit a household, how can a robot go through a stick of obst shaped obstacles like the house and the beams of the house, or how can it navigate inside the inside the room, inside the half partially damaged uh, house? And of course, the meter and valve operation, which kind of like coincides with that of the planned disaster. The second competition that I would like to say and talk about is called Robo One competition. It's actually contributing to the development of lightweight humanoid robots. So the story is that there are people who gather around with their own robots, and they are not researchers or from any great research institutes. They are simply school students, university graduates, and sometimes PhD graduates like me. So we gather around and we combat with, uh, with each other's robots and we see how much stable each robots and how, what are the great, great uh, strong points of each of the robots. So these are some of the robots and there are many other pictures uh, like that. And uh, we can see all of them are lightweight, small sized robots developed by students and university students. And uh, this actually paved the path of the future robotics technologies which come up because robotics is also a kind of an integration of various technologies like uh, computer, say, computer imaging, then inertial sensors, then actuating technologies, and of course the mechanical design and many more to that. So when someone is being uh, groomed in that way, someone is interested in that way. So it's actually interesting to see so many uh, students and so many young minds there when they come together and just participate and enjoy the time. So this is a kind of an assembly room when we are where we are asked to assemble our robot. And this is the battle ring where two robots can battle with each other or combat with each other. It's just like wrestling, uh, but uh, in a very peaceful way, of course. And and it's also a great uh, privilege to be there because we can take many feedback from there. Like we can analyze the videos later, how the robots are uh, 
like they are behaving or they how they are doing any kind of manipulation how they stand up when they are hit by other robots so they actually contributes to the research so this is uh, on the left side actually uh, this is our story when we participated in one of the competition and the ro our robot cage are uh, 3hv it actually went up to the semi final and in which we can see the different kinds of challenges and the robot faces and it actually uh, it was helpful for us to improve the robots further in the following years the third one being the maker fair which is uh, interesting about uh, like which is not only related to robotics but there are various electronic components which are being exhibited and students and school children they are also participating and in india we have this in hyderabad unfortunately uh, last year due to the pandemic uh, it was not held and maybe i don't i'm not sure about this year but uh, it's actually but we need in india i think we can suggest more robotics and electronics uh, exhibitions or electronics categories where we can assemble together various young minds and young students so that we can come up with some interesting technologies and designs which may help us in future so these are on the left side there are some robots which are rovers and rovs which are developed by various uh, many peoples like it can be a student uh, he can be a uh, like university student or any hobbyist or on the left right side we can see there are different booths who are used uh, who are using their robots or other uh, DIY, diy projects to entertain people in this project actually uh, i presented once to the kyoto in kyoto maker fair in 2020 where uh, i made as uh, from scratch an agricultural robot and this robot was used for cleaning the weeds in a rice field so that robot was exhibited in that uh, in that exhibition in kyoto i would like to share two case studies in tripura yesterday when uh, while discussing with uh, professor prithviraj you uh, prithviraj uh, and uh, we were interested about his how he used the thermal imaging for his purpose so when i came back uh, after like my graduation i came for a short holiday and uh, i was seeing that during the so like when well, during the time when corona the second wave hit our country uh, there was a lot of people who actually gather around during the evening time like for example from 5 pm to for example 7 pm so in that case 5 pm to 7 pm there are crowds who are, who are gathering around various places of uh, eateries like restaurants and uh, drink, not, not drinking spot like for example soft drinks or teas and coffees and everything and they are chatting with their friends and colleagues and other uh, relatives maybe so this actually what i was thinking that uh, in this time how they actually how these crowds affect the infection rate of infection in that area so what i uh, what i did personally is that i traveled from one point to the another point you can, on the right hand side you can see the google map it's a point from my house to another point in in our city i traveled for 10 days and gathered some places and just noted some places where i can see that there are eateries and restaurants and people are gathering from five o'clock and seven o'clock so what i wanted to do is that how i then i tried to find out what are the different uh, what is the infection rate in those areas so that i can relate the infection rates and the possible in infection rates in the future to the eateries so that was a kind of a project proposal but unfortunately this uh, everything was closed up uh, closed down uh, for uh, following the second wave the government closed uh, all the eateries from and it was a lockdown for our state uh, and uh, but it was interesting to see that how the drones can be useful and what i was thinking is that uh, thermal imaging can be used to track the crowds in the city and if we can track the crowds in a daily basis like in a real time basis we can actually track how the eateries are contributing uh, to the possible cluster formation of the infection like for example 
there is a for a given uh, word like W1, W2, we can see on the right hand side the whole area, the whole city or the town is divided into a number of words and the red blocks, they actually represent uh, different eateries and restaurants. So if we can track the uh, the crowd who are assembling around those places, we can say that, okay, how can it be related to the possible clusters? For example, like when there is an eatery, the people are coming from the neighboring words or neighboring places, and there are infections coming from other words, areas. And also there is an outflow. That means infections are moving from this area to the outer, outside area of this area, from one cluster to the, uh, forming another cluster. So first thing I wanted to uh, do is that the collection and distribution, that means the basic information and before detection and after detection, that is the, the table which is shown here. Like may, uh, this is basically the data of how many people are affected or infected by the coronavirus in a particular area. The second thing is that localization and mapping, that means uh, identify the eating places, the eateries and the restaurants in that particular area. And so that we can predict and we can do a history analysis and theoretically extrapolate and explain and predict the possible infection cluster in future. Uh, so in that case, I thought that, okay, the thermal imaging can be very useful because uh, doing this manually from going from one point to the other point, traveling every day is uh, really hectic for a person. So in that case, uh, I found it interesting to share. The second thing, of course, I'd like to share is the reservoir health monitoring. It's a Dombur hydroelectric power project. It's a big project. And uh, of course, we are always interested in the informatics of this uh, of this hydroelectric power project. That means we are interested to know the what is the condition of this hydroelectric power project. So in that case, of course, there are two parts. There can be two parts, and I believe the uh, eminent panelists and the resource person can help us in this regard, help our state government in this regard. For example, yesterday I heard, I have listened to Professor U. Prithviraj, and also today I have listened to Dr. Chirag, uh, Mr. Chirag Gupta from NISAC. So using, I think, uh, for a real-time water pressure monitoring, uh, for example, I can start with this, for uh, the flood management system, a spatial pattern of the hazard susceptibility, and then a UAV-based, first we needed a model of the surface based on which we can understand the, how the area will be how, how the area will be affected if there is a possible flood so that is dm based flood simulation which on which i stressed a lot and the second thing we can uh, we can ask for a spatial pattern of the hazard susceptibility for example if we have this dm dm or dsm uh, of that area using the unmanned vehicles like drones and fixed wing aircraft. So we can use that for understanding or knowing the informatics of that area. And uh, using that, we can simulate how the area will be affected when there is a flood. And of course, at the end, we can design a decision support system for that area, which is really helpful and really needed in our state. And the, the first one, of course, uh, I'm sorry, I visited the flood management system first. The first one is that the reservoir monitoring, which is a little bit different from the uh, aerial vehicle. So in that case, I believe that uh, we can suggest the government of Tripura or to have to use the, the utilize the marine vehicles or the water vehicles which are being developed and being presented in this training, uh, in this training uh, online program by different dignitaries to use those uh, water vehicles and ROVs. It can be remotely operated, it can be automated, it can be autonomous, of course, for understanding the water pressure on the dam structure, on the reservoir structure. And the under, for that, underwater mapping is very much needed. In Nepal, there are cases where to understand the glacial outburst there are various underwater vehicles which are used to map the underwater of the sea sea uh, and not uh, sea these are called like himalayan earthquakes kind of that if I, I may be wrong in that case so they are using those different kinds of robots underwater robots or surface robots for properly mapping the water bodies and in that case 
we can predict the structure of the glaciers. We can, for for example, in this case, we can predict the structure and the, any possible seepage, any possible leakage in the uh, in the civil structure, in the mechanical structure of the dam. And of course, at the end, the pressure on the sluice gate, and that's also an interesting thing to uh, take up on. For example, I share. One of the present uh, one of the paper, which is from uh, Rich Macon University, they worked on a dam structure, and they used their robot to understand for the health monitoring of this ro of this dam in Mie Prefecture of Japan, and they are using a robot which is actually launched under the water, and it goes to a, it slowly moves towards the uh, structure and attaches using some pressure plates. And after that, it can move along the structure and it can monitor the health of the of the dam of the reservoir. So as a part of the conclusion, I will say that, of course, the lightweight robots, which I discussed previously in the in this presentation, uh, this is very much application specific. It's a design which always is uh, applied for cases where it's uh, very much limited to the environment because the lightweight robots, they have various limitations as far as the present designs are concerned. And we are constantly working on this part. And the second thing is that there are potential application for post disaster information gathering and also, for example, underwater mapping. Now, uh, for example, I, I didn't, I worked on an autonomous water vehicle, which of course I showed here. For example, for agriculture purpose, for weeding in rice farmers, but uh, we can use that also for the underwater mapping, and that can be also categorized as a lightweight robot. And the third part be, point being the simple realization of multivariable control theory. So the, that's the basic, the best way to work upon and to do research is to take up a lightweight robot and study and analyze the multivariable control theory. And uh, as far as the state of Tripura is concerned, of course, informatics is uh, one of the important thing which is very much needed. Uh, we need information. We need to learn more about our own state. And that's why we need the help of the uh, respected dignitaries and imp uh, researchers of our own country. And uh, I hope, I, I believe that we can have their help and uh, we can have their assistance and to understand our country they can they can make us understand our own situation in in much more clearer way and second being the close collaboration is needed for that of course the leading research with you leading researchers of the country it's a great privilege to listen to you throughout the presentation and of course the last point but not the least is that simulation based field analysis which i always uh, suggest being a similar like a robotics engineer, I always stress upon the simulation because before going a play, going towards a field analysis or field study, of course, we understand we need to understand the simulation. What is going to be there if there is a problem? Like we have to be, as Professor Tadokoro of Tohoku University, he rightly said, like we must be very much ready for the situation which we cannot even imagine. So in that case, we. I believe, and of course, the robotics engineers believe that simulation is very much needed for all types of robotic scenario, be it any kind of aerial vehicle or a humanoid robot or anything. So I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to learn and learn and learn, and of course, to share my experiences. I hope I can contribute with all your assistance and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunandan, for that uh, remarkable presentation. I think uh, it was, I, I, I would also like to share that this uh, to the audience, uh, all of those who are connected with us today, that uh, Sunandan is, uh, is from Tripura and he's, he's, would be, he would be involved with us throughout. Uh, he has been involved and would be also uh, involved in future while we are, you know, putting together uh, you know the, the outcomes of this of this very uh, uh, platform. These three days of uh, online training program, and we will use his expertise. And he just we all witnessed the sort of uh, uh, insights he has on the subject. Uh, the perspective which he shared was very fresh, and something very very informative for all of us uh, who who are on this call. 
and I would also like to take uh, this opportunity to welcome um, uh, addition secretary uh, Aninde Kumar Bhattacharya from uh, the government of Tripura, uh, uh, addition secretary in the disaster management division. A very warm welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, to this platform. Um, uh, I know Dr. Ghosh is very eager to make some comments, and as I can see on, on, on based on Sunandan's presentation, and of course, all the three presentations which were made uh, uh, today, uh, they were very, very interesting, very intriguing, thought-provoking. Uh, uh, I have so much to, in fact, uh, uh, to think about, you know, now this concept has started, and what Sarajji also mentioned, that, you know, we have to uh, uh you know we, we should work closely with the government of tripura and i think these experts like sunandan and many other alok mukherjee ji was also here a short while back i don't know if he's still there i just saw him uh sign out but uh, uh that the, he he heads the robotics division at uh, drdo i think we have the right set of people who have come together in this on this platform and we can use their expertise and their knowledge to really work closely with the state government and develop something more meaningful in times to come. Over to you, Dr. Ghosh. Huh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Ruba. Uh, yeah, this is uh, something that uh, uh, while uh, listening to, in fact, I have not taken my lunch today um, because I do not want to waste my time in taking that. Sitting uh, here in my computer and listening to each and every slides that uh, today three presentations made. And uh, while listening to Sunan, uh, Sunandan and uh, giving a full coverage of what really uh, robotics is and uh, the drone that which is uh, we are using it, the, the behind that it is all this research that which is going on across the globe, especially Japan. And I fondly remember when I stayed there in nine, uh, almost six years, seven months, uh, nine months, I was there, 1988, April to 2005, Japan. Oh. And when uh, I saw the, uh, he has made the 1973 onward till recently that he has listed out in one of his slides. Uh, yes. Which are the types of, like Waseda University, it is a great university even though it is private university. Yes. And yes. when I saw a name, uh, Ashimo, uh, which was developed yeah. in 2000, at that time I was there, then I took my children, because at that time, that was the humanoid uh, robot, when it is developed, billions of dollars they spent up, I think it is Honda, yes. uh, made yes, by Honda yes. company. Yes. And yes. then in order to have a, like he has mentioned in his uh, presentation also, humanoid robot, uh, it is something that uh, something looks like a to, human. How to make our human like nature with it so that we can make a friend, not an enemy or anything, or Frankenstein or anything that. Yes. So, yes. in order to promote that, Japan government has placed uh, those uh, humanite robots like Ashimo, I remember, in many of the museums and schools. Yes. And I remember I took my children to Tokyo from Sukuba. Oh. Uh, to, I, to see I, that and there is a huge admission fee because the, yes. the amount of billions of money that they spent up like when we go to disneyland we pay a substantial yes. amount at that time we yes. paid i think ten thousand yen or something so yes, in, order to, in order to bring out that money from the public to make a friendship with the ashimo kind of human i developed at that time that was the kind of culture that they used to make so I was I, thrilled and, uh, and uh, seeing that how competition and another case that uh, I would like to like robot competition where not only children, but also there he has shown in one of his slide, a lot of gray haired or white haired uh, Japanese are also there. Yes. yes. Grandchildren are playing. So grandfathers or mothers are also. Okay. Yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, and that is something that I remember when my children are two years and four years old, when they were studying in Japan, then every year, Sukuba is called Science City of Japan. It was created I, in one of the International yes. Expo in 1985. Yes. So yes. Sukuba City is having more than 200 lab, and AIST is their headquarters. It's one of them. One, one of them. them. 
so every summer see we are talking of lot of thing disaster management plan and other things but every summer school authorities were directed by mayor or all city across the country to visit all those labs with the children and parents must be there along with the children I'm and with along you, yeah. with a small book where at least 50 laboratories pages are there they have visited or not there will be a right. dedicated staff used to be there every laboratory and whenever parents visits along with the children then whether they have visited there should be a stamp which is a proof then this is being submitted to the school the school will assess that and based on that they also assess that who have visited how many and based on that they make some kind of sieving that who did better then they make from school level in the city to regional level and other level that yes. was the kind of you know uh, surveillance that they keep on the on the children and, and also that's a, i sorry to interrupt you sir and also i think that's a kind of a very high inspiration they are also imparting to the students because uh, of course, this maker fair and all all this they actually keep on inspiring and uh, motivating various students, mostly school students, and there are different levels of technologies. Like when we talk about robotics, of course, we talk about high computer like uh, programming in Python or with uh, like yeah, yeah. Uh, dealing with libraries, very sophisticated machine learning libraries, for example. But when they are doing it, uh, they can also do it in with the very uh, low level, low complexity softwares. So, which is also interesting to do with uh, with the school children because there is not much much more of the complexity, but they are actually getting the test, they getting the flavor of what it's actually. So that's uh, interesting. And about uh, Waseda robot, uh, it's actually there is a story because the story uh, the history started in 1973 in Waseda University, but most of that time the robots which were made it was. Uh, especially university based like made up in the university workshops and they were not using much of the good uh, mechanical uh, like li li links for example we can say they were not using cast irons so honda was first time who took up this project in 1982 and it was a secret project for 10 years from 1982 to 1992 for, for this 10 years they carried out this project and in 1992 it was a blast it was a great successful when it was a human sized robot and it was have it was showing higher stabilities and of course it was casted with uh, mechanical links cast irons and of course and the actuator technology was improved so i believe in case of japan the technology of electronics technology of automation which actually was a backbone for beca behind this robotics uh, uh, market or robotics technology which is now booming all over the world so that's what interesting yes sir and so i would like yeah, to yeah. Listen. Uh, excellent you have given uh, more uh, clarity on this that how you see company has taken up these things from the yes, university yes and yeah. which of course uh, now india with uh, being uh, india now we are seeing that such kind of effort they yes. started in the 1980s uh, now we have started here in india uh, with uh, lots of software and hardware coming up and there are competitions are being held here hackathon also being mm. held and even there are many universities now having this kind of competition where you have come robot yes. competition and yes of course five years back or ten years back we used to get some items from china or even a small kid moving with a buzzing uh, shoe shoe or whatever chapel which will make sound uh, uh, some kelona something yes, like yes, that yes. but kind now that <laughs> Yeah, when walking and then it gives a sound, what enjoyment the children used to get. So in Japan, in fact, it is unexhausted. The way that they have made the young generation tuned yes. to the development. Any mm -hmm. test that they are doing in their national laboratory, whether it is earthquake test, five-story, soft-story building test they used to do, they used to call in open invitation to each and every people because they consider that it is a yes. people's money that they are investing there. So yes. in those tests where preparation takes more than a month or two, like earthquake test, shake table test, centrifuge test. So there is a robust spaces are there to call the common people to see that what they are, how their money is being utilized. 
Yes, so, yes, that, that's actually interesting, like, because it's a taxpayer's money. So I remember one of my, uh, like, first time I, when I joined, I used to get the scholarship from the MEXT, which is the organization who uh, uh, controls all the, all this channelization of money. So, and the performance of one year was always, uh, like, after completing, completing one year, my performance was, uh, like, evaluated. And based on the performance, my stipend used to go up or down. And there is a kind of a uh, like not a margin, like a maximum limit and minimum limit. And of course, I have to do my best to uh, to do that to perform well, of course. And the second thing is that for our research, we used to get money funding, for example, building up robots and buying up components. And we have to avail those money within a particular period of time. And if that if we don't avail and the money used to be sent back to the mixed because my professor said, of course, it's taxpayers money, so we cannot simply waste or just we cannot simply keep them in the university. So it has to be returned. So th this is a, this actually sh shows that uh, how we are so much concerned about the taxpayers money and how we use them for our own development. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, it's such a wonderful synergy that uh, is there. I think uh, for yeah. us, uh, for the country, like uh, mm -hmm. it is almost 16, 17 years, but I still fondly remember uh, that what has happened, what still they are continuing, that is what that you are doing. And these are unending uh, things. And that is why Japan is Japan. But uh, now we say that uh, uh, with the kind of interaction that we had and and also the kind one thing just I want to say that while you are in Tripura now and the effort that in the last part that you have shown to track uh, the COVID patients from the eateries which during first wave probably they did not do but later on when lockdown came then it was not possible uh, but yeah. with that, now there are many uh, like counting of the people now there are many ready-made devices uh, being manufactured with mm. the foreign company, but in India itself, in Delhi itself. I, I have come to know about LoRa-based technology, low radiation, uh, or it is called rudder-based. Yes, rudder-based yeah. technology rudder with a range of 857 megahertz to 860 megahertz, which is known everyone. So through through that gateway, if a gateway is established within 300 kilometer. It range is 300 to 500 kilometer. So in Delhi, like in Nehru place, it is about 40 kilometer from here. So I am within that range. So I visited there two months back. And then we are sitting in another room. And then it is able to count how many people are there in that room. And they I see. put only one. So it is through this technology, they are able panic buttons and switch. And, and at least 10 devices are there which they have made, they can also make a movable carbon dioxide monitoring devices. Whereas in Delhi, mm. we have, I think, around 20 uh, air quality monitor. But air quality monitor in terms of carbon dioxide measurement using a small wearable device, which is now available ready-made, and it is being sold like hot cake in the European country from the company, which is Indian company. So uh, with the time that many things are there, only things that we are not aware of. So they are happy dealing with foreign company because most of the schools in US, in, in Germany, they say it, Munich or Germany, they are having in each classroom, there is one panic button, which doesn't have any wear, nothing. That panic button uh, is hardly few thousand rupees and they are selling it because they are getting lots of order. And so that panic button in school, colleges, or in any any marketplaces everywhere, and they have installed many things in Delhi also in some of the marketplaces, multi-story flat. So these are available with the aid of foreign, like Honda came up to support Waseda University in 1982. So now Hi. these are the things are many foreign companies are looking forward that please establish. Uh, the things in your so that you don't have to pay export or import tax and other thing, 30 percent or something yeah. is there. So yeah. now there are a lot of such uh, interest is there. Even carbon dioxide monitoring itself, one of the research paper mm -hmm. through their LoRa technology switch, which we saw that they are able to monitor carbon dioxide if it is going beyond 1000 ppm, like 419 is the current 
overall global limit, then there is a uh, there is an issue of uh, spreading this uh, coronavirus because yes. when we mm -hmm. are four or five people are here, like in the room, and within mm -hmm. two three hours it becomes two thousand. Mm -hmm. So th with this uh, kind of hand uh, technology, where nowhere nothing, even a pencil battery is more than enough to keep it on for more than five oh, years. So I understand. Much development has occurred and it has not entered. Only problem is that. Uh, Technology as well as improvisation has spread over many of the company. Yesterday also we have uh, one presentation from Abhishek Ghosh. You see all mm. foreign company being collaborated uh, on, yes. on. But thing is, this has not entered into our corridor of research or institution, which you emphasized in your presentation also. Research, Hi. research, research level. So uh, even though these are available in the market, but it has not entered into the corridor of our research institutions or school yet. Even though yes. government has given now full emphasis on creating skill university, or even skill universities are coming up. And then uh, there are many other efforts like, uh, like MSME. There are many, uh, it is yes. a game changer now in the country. Yes. So, uh, and then most of the IAT uh, uh, now they are having some robotic section and even drone sections are also there. As you mentioned, even just it is for children. It is not that Python or C plus plus they have to know. Make some basic yes. level of things like basic language that we used to learn in the beginning. Yes. More yes. Than yes. Years back. Actually, it starts like for example in robotics or computer vision the. Basics uh, starts with the coordinate geometry, with, which we are studying in high school. Exactly. So coordinate geometry. So if something, if the foundation is strong, of course, uh, no one can stop. Yeah, that's one interesting thing. So any very basic things are very much important. Yes. Okay. So, okay. okay thank okay. you, sir, thank for you this very much, opportunity. Uh, really. I want, huh? to, I want to thank you, sir, for this opportunity of learning and sharing yeah. my experience. You have made really the platform much, much. You see, our participants, they are, they are there. And yes. of course, this is, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving a, such a lucid and such a wonderful, along with your little effort while you are in Tipura to check that concentration of those patients in and out or in the iter iteries. So we yes, take yes, it yes. up. Uh, we'll take it up with this company that which I come to know. Uh, yes, we'll take yes. it up with the Tipura government uh, uh, yes, that yes. using this LoRa uh, switch there itself. And then with, with cycle or like you have gone to 10, 15 places by yourself, but this yes, can yes. be taken in any, any car. It is just a small device, maybe a hundred gram weight, which can right. be tracked along with the uh, switch uh, that which can be established there itself, their gateway which will collect information, we can see sitting here with the internet in my server or your server. So we would like uh -huh. to introduce these things, including the reservoir uh, monitoring, yes. where now many monitoring. such uh, devices are available to monitor yes. water level and leakages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have been we have been seeing all many case, many lectures on this, uh, yeah. like reservoir from any sec only. I listened just a few hours ago and also yeah. yesterday, Dr. Prithviraj. So it, yeah. that was really interesting and also helpful for. So I believe it will be helpful for state government of Tripura also. So yeah. that's yeah. so. Thank you, thank you, sir. So, thank you. So not only that, Rob, uh, just to I'm telling too much, but only thing is that though our focus state is Tripura, because online due to COVID has made everything universal. Whatever we are delivering over here, it is Tripura. Yes, but we are thankful to Tripura. And also the addition secretary, uh, Mr. Bandhapadai, uh, for facilitating this uh, kind of uh, uh, meeting of minds and through the internet. And uh, we are just emissary of that. And I hope that Tipura will take the lead. But it is message is universal. Thank yes, you. Yes, of course, that's true. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sunandan. Again, uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, we have Anindya Kumar Bhattacharya ji with us, Addition Secretary. Uh, Saraji, would you like to uh, share uh, uh, any thoughts before we invite uh, the Addition Secretary to to uh, uh, for for his remarks, please? Okay. Uh, 
thank you uh, rubab ji actually just you know in curiosity i was you know uh, trying to you know get some information from you know sunan dr sunandan and you know for the clarification clarification means i see the uh you know now what days in tripura uh, you know you know looking at your presentations so what i co relate to uh, the recent incidents ki actually uh, in last you know four months uh, we have you know about you know four uh, drowning sorry more than that more, four, six drowning cases uh, in our state and you know it took you know days to find out the bodies because you know in tripura uh, the you know during the flood season basically when the rains uh, the speed the current the, the, of the river is very high and you know it goes all the rivers you know go to you know bangladesh uh, that also you know all the rivers you know the span of the rivers is very short and uh, we had to search you know these bodies for the long by ndra by fire services our you know, sdr you know many uh, uh, others uh, can you know this you know robots you know underground robots can help on this uh, this is one number two is the similarly in the fire incidents also occur in many places and there are also the fixed places in tripura where you know the, every year you know you know that the occurrence of the fire in the same places and those places are so busy and so narrow uh, and you know on non engineering you know, structures uh, then you know our fire tenders cannot also enter many cases of what we have seen the properties also get, get damaged as well as the lives also get lost so whether you know there is you know when the robots can help to identify those you know uh, bodies and also the vulnerabilities and also during the normal you know situations uh, you know for doing this uh, you know assessment and also the planning number 3 uh, in the you know you have shown you know in the presentation you showed this you know domburu dam scenario in the domburu dam scenario in the that the two vulnerabilities number one is that you know the in tripura the soil is very loose due to the, the heavy siltation in the upper catchment areas the domburu dam is you know the depth you know getting sink so the depth uh, uh, you know earlier 10 years back how it was you know 40 years back now it is not much so if there is no heavy rainfall so that the definitely you know the soil is get you know has to be opened so uh, you know we want to have the assessment you know uh, under this you know um, dam uh, for to uh, get the health uh, information number two god forbid you know if the big earthquakes occur then uh, this uh, uh, the old uh, sluice gate breaks of dumbru dam will not believe the entire three districts in the lower side will be washed away and it will go to the bangladesh so in that case also you want to have in the detailed studies uh, by using the lidar uh, you know drone as well as the robots whatever i don't know because i am not into that you know technical side but in from the administration could you please help us under this you know three scenarios of what i told on underwater you know above water and above the surface as well as also the, the dam scenario could you please you know help us how we can go up uh, because you know mr chirag gupta he might have been some information on this and uh, mr abhishek das gupta from the tsc also he might have some information on this and you are also there and professor uh, chandan ghosh also he can also add on this we are very curious curious to know and also we have to implement you know this uh, aspects uh, in disaster management uh, activities over to you please so uh, may i please yes okay so as we have discussed like for example i'm taking with the dam structure monitoring for example in case of reservoir monitoring for example like real time water pressure monitoring so how much water what's the first we need a volumetric study the second thing we need to real uh, we need a real time monitoring system so there can be I, i'm just saying for example i'm just saying what we can do the, the thing is that uh, of course it has to be analyzed and it has to be studied very much in detail so uh, we of course depending upon the situation and scenario we can come up with different kinds of robot it's uh, sometimes well, like we cannot have the one robot solving many problems but of course like for example for underwater mapping we need one kind of uh, robot and for example so the same robot can be used for uh, me like measuring the pressures on the sluice gates and of course and the same time of course the water pressure 
and the underwater mapping can be solved. Now, based on that, that's one about like early monitoring system. Like we are getting the data from that robot remotely to a to the base station. That means how much is the pressure? The second thing is that uh, about uh, the which is coming from, for example, if I take the presentations or if I as I have I, I can remember from the presentation of NESAC and TSAC and yesterday, uh, Dr. Uh, Prithviraj, that means we can use a digital surface model or an elevation model to understand to survey the area. So that means informatics. We need informatics and data of that area. Now, when we are using that, how we use that data? First of all, I say that uh, the simulation. For example, instead of doing like uh, we get the data, we get a DM based. Uh, we can go for a flat simulation, and there are various softwares. In that respect, I, I can uh, I can request or uh, the state government I can suggest the state government to uh, ask the respected civil engineers who who do, who are comfortable who are doing work on this flood simulation like three D flow simulation. Now, for example, roboticists we don't use flood simulation. Well, we used similar software, which we say physics engines. That means physics based simulations. And we use that for, for example, tsunami simulation, how tsunami is going to hit affect the, uh, the coastal areas like that, for example. So in that case, when we have this spatial pattern, when we have this DEM or DSM, we can use that for flood simulation. And based on the flood simulation, we can have the spatial pattern of the hazard susceptibility. That means, of course, how the, if there is a possible breakage in the dam, how the dam and what, if the if the volume is estimated, for example, using the model, if we can give the volume, then how this volume of water is going to affect the surrounding areas if there's a possible breakage. And based on all these things, we can dis design a decision support system, which is maybe which may be a big project in, in this way. So decision support system or flood management system, which comprises of various subtopics and also it's like uh, it's having a, a application of do drones for the UAV rain, UAV like UAV based DA, DEM or DESM, then it can be using like different underwater vehicles, underwater robots, which will be used for underwater mapping and health monitoring of the reservoir. It can use a surface surface robot, which can float on the water surface in the reservoir in the upper bank uh, in the upper altitude, a uh, higher altitude, uh, and it can monitor how much water is there and how much is the pressure on the sluice gate. So there may be two or three multiple uh, categories of robot which can be used. And I, I also su suggest means if uh, the dignitaries, if the uh, respected uh, pa panelists can suggest on this issue also. And as, as far as the rescue operation, the first point, the river drowning, and second point is the fire incidents, which uh, Dr. Shanad Dasji said has said uh, about river drowning. Uh, of course, I, I think we need to discuss on this issue more. Uh, presently, uh, it has to be like uh, maybe unmanned aerial vehicle or any other technology if they can help us in this regards or like fire incidents also, I will say with the same. Okay, actually, uh, Dr. Sunandan, actually, just I wanted to know whether there is the, there are any scopes, you know, for using this, you know, uh, drone uh, UAVs uh, later and also the robotics for that, because these are the pro, you know problems we are facing for the saving the lives and also for saving the properties during you know response and also for the mitigation activities, you know how it can be do. What you told that though, you know, this is a multidisciplinary approach. Definitely, we can you know sit down and also plan it of how you know this can be integrated in our planning processes. And uh, uh, many things are to be discussed, uh, you know, many thanks to, uh, you know, uh, NIDM and also Kiki for organizing this. And sir, actually one thing I want to discuss if the time permits, uh, should I, should I, you know, uh, share something? Yeah, please, please. Uh, during 2017, 2018 and 2019, we had the severe floods in our state, right? You know that you know the share of uh, SDRF. You know that you know uh, the, if there is a uh, disaster uh, loss, then you know we have to compensate. You know out of this in SDRF and Tripura share uh, towards an SDRF is very very less. So uh, as for the you know government of India mechanism, we have to send this uh, memorandum to the government of India for uh, additional support uh, out of this NDRF National Disaster Response Fund. 
the you know the problem what we faced during the time the you know the, this the rapid damage assessment and also detailed damage assessment and pdna or disaster needs assessment that the three aspects in the kushti sir also was you know discussing this in the pdna in the past day uh, we are not aware about because tripura never gone to you know that stage for submission of the uh, you know memorandum to government of india for you know giving the additional funding but you know 2017 to the 18 and 19 bound to you know submit that you know memorandum to government of india but you know the problem was that during the agricultural loss during you know uh, the particular other damage we can show that you know, these are damaged and uh, you know uh, you know that the uh, you know portfolio then after submission of uh, this memorandum the central team will visit to the state they will again access you know they'll tally you know, what we have uh, you know submitted on a memorandum and also the physical you know status at that particular time then they decide how much fund will be given additional fund will be given to the state but the problem is that for you know, at that time the duration, the differences between the submission of the memorandum, the fraud damage submission of the memorandum, and the you know date of visit of this central team is very huge. By that time, the farmers they will not wait, you know, the damage field. Definitely, they will show, uh, you know, for you know for any agricultural products. But when the central team do visit, they see that you know the crop land is green. You know, they never see such kind of a devastation at that time. I thought, you know, the use of drone capturing the images, you know, before the disaster and during the disaster and also after the disaster is very, very essential. And for that, I feel, you know, for Tripura like state, we need to have such kind of exercises in a periodically, basically seasonally hazards, you know, before the floods, before the monsoon season, during the monsoon and also the after monsoon, if we think to submit, you know, the, uh, the memorandum of the government opinion to get, you know, the additional fund. Sir, we, we did not get, you know, additional, you know, adequate fund from the government of India. And there also so many problems we used to face. I think, you know, this uh, high-end technologies by using, you know, drones, litter, and also many uh, technologies may help us uh, for the state government to uh, get the better fund, not only, you know, for the disaster response to as the damage, but also, the, you know, during uh, normal time for the better planning uh, and assessment. Thank you, sir. That's that from my side. Okay. Okay. Uh, one thing is very nicely uh, pointed out that, especially with the funds and other things. First thing that we have to learn about the making the project, uh, which is not being done in a coercive manner, making the project and then what are the components. And now, like this program, we have come to know who is who now. Who is who? And not only it is a cross boundary across the globe who is working and we can help each other. So in that case, uh, whatever robotic aspect that we have discussed over here, right, uh, in all these three days, uh, it is all, Sunandan also mentioned, civil engineers are to be there. It is all about like in medical science, we are doing MRI scan, CT scan, or blood test, or all this pathological examination. But for surgeon to do the work in the like dam that you have mentioned for that, Qualified experts, civil engineers, they have to check, they have to be there in the field, they have to be given free hand and free flow of knowledge and expertise available elsewhere in the country and abroad. That part is very, very essential. Otherwise, having a good drone photo or it is a tool only, but to assess that, we need ground-based surgeons like uh, who will do the tumor surgery or something and in the in the dam or which is getting silted and to stop the siltations we have many natural method and many such control methods are there on site based on this information taken by robot or taken by uh, satellite taken by many other uh, say iot devices ultimately decision is to be taken by the expert engineers who are looking into that at starting from the seal formation, reservoir is getting uh, full very soon and leakage is occurring. So there is some, uh, you know, surveillance based on the surveillance, then those uh, strengthening as well as uh, controlling measures are to be done by the expert civil engineer and which is available in the country as well as uh, we hope that based on uh, some project that which is to be framed well and uh, along with the various component and consortium of the team that which we have been discussing 
uh, that uh, we can make a, a team of experts and for pathological examination and for surgery all together and make a total project report which if given to the state government and you know the equation between uh, Tripura government and central government is very nicely equated uh, so <laughs> So when it is there, then you have to make your demand, not in terms of only simply itna crore chahiye. Jo hum hamesha bolte, itna paisa chahiye hume. No, that paisa. With so much scientific brain uh, involved here with the robots and uh, with so much surveillance teams are there, we have to put up certain value there based on their work, job, and completion, as well as then final operation. If we make a complete report on that, uh, document on that, then of course, it will be always uh, taken care of. Of course, I'm not talking from government side, but thing is that we have to make a proper, you know, documentation of the facts and finding out the root cause and then solution, which will be taken component wise, time wise, activity wise, like we submit some research uh, proposal to DST, MOES or other thing. If it is done, it is always their government is always looking forward to uh, to to take all steps taken by the Tripura. Absolutely, sir. Sir, one more thing, you know, uh, we I think we missed off, uh, like you know, uh, like in the Fifteen Finance Commission, that the provision for you know doing this uh, insurance in disaster management. Yeah. After sir. for insurance, uh, you know, the all these insurance sector they need all these data repositories. And you know yeah. all this data, not only you know the historical data, but also this UAV data also they need. We had yeah. you know different various consultations. They need the what yeah. you have, you know, the image, images of you know last this thing, and what you, whether you have you know later data and also this you know UAV data. These are also very much required. What I wanted to say that for mitigation measures and you know, for the insurance sector for this risk, disaster risk transfer. You know, this uh, aspect is very much required and that's why Tripura government, though it is small, we have the less resources. So we wanted to have this in UAVs for this purposes. Sir. And uh, one more thing, you know, Dr. Sunan's presentation also what you said that, you know, the exposure to the, you know, common man, it is very much required, sir. Like, you know, why, you know, what do we are doing, the, doing this, you know, mock drill in the schools and in you know, common places? Can we have, you know, this kind of demo of this UAVs in those places during the normal time? And also the people should know the students also they should they should know they understand also the better you know the suggestions they can you know have the better uh, this thing used during the time of need uh sir will i think after this training program why uh, what we understood you know uh, during the disaster that we should not use particularly for the disaster management for also for the people you know civilians exposure we need to have you know uh, capacity building and so awareness so that you know at the time of real disaster they can use uh, you know this uh, uh, instrument properly sir yeah. next to you sir yeah. okay so uh I think uh, the, uh, based on there will be an outcome document based on this three days deliberation which are of course on record, but we'll make a complete report based on this, which uh, already on the first day, uh, Dr. Sunandan was uh, um, ascribed to this, uh, this duty, but we'll all work together with whatever we have discussed. And then a specific uh, report that we are going to make along with the action points and also budgetary support that what will be required based on the outcome of this report, which will be, uh, jointly it will be through nidm side and all the experts will be communicating and will come out with a with a decision making uh, outcome uh, for you thank you sir sir we have now our you know uh, additional secretary uh, yep. Ravi, uh, and you know director disaster relief rehabilitation disaster management he's also the director of civil defense and, all, and also he's the director of you know the fire and emergency services okay uh, what is that sir he's so kind enough you know though uh, our secretary ma'am is very busy and you know this is kin but of course he has attended he has been attending he has been attending uh the training program since last two days and okay. uh, you know we are very fortunate to have with him you know uh, in this program uh, let's, uh, uh, I may request uh, uh, also to, uh, uh, to welcome him and let's, you know, go what he can uh, give yes. us, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Saraji, and thank you so much. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are really grateful to government of Tripura and we are also uh, very thankful uh, to, to uh, the, the state government for such active participation. 
during this uh, three day online training program. And a special welcome, a very good evening, uh, Mr. Anindya Kumar Bhattacharya Ji, uh, Additional yeah. Secretary and Director, Disaster Management, Civil Defense, and Fire and Emergency Services. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for your support in successfully organizing these three days of online training program, which is a joint effort of, uh, of uh, NIDM and FICI CIDM board, uh, which has been also supported by the private sector in form of Bayer Group, the very famous uh, globally renowned Bayer Group from Germany, the Crop Science Division. Um, uh, I know you, you've taken out time from a very busy schedule, Anindaji. I would not, without taking any longer, I would request you for your remarks uh, on, 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 on this entire concept of role of drones in disaster management and the conduct of these uh, uh, three days which we have done. Over to you, uh, uh, Anindaji. Namaskar. Namaskar. In Bengali, we, we tell the Namaskar, and in <laughs> we tell the Kurunkha. This is your tradition. That is why in the last day we are telling. The very good afternoon, sir. On the behalf of the state government in revenue department, we find that that online training program on roll out drones in disaster management has been fantastically organized by the with great support from the National Institute of Digital Management and FIKI. I also, on behalf of the state government, convey our thanks and gratitude to NIDM, particularly Major General Bindal, Executive Director at NIDM, I salute you, sir. I also convey the same thing to Professor Chandan Ghosh and others. I cannot name others also. All the finest mind has come here. Last three days, Dr. Sarojji, who is, who is virtually face of disaster management in Timbura and disaster management in his blood. Night and 3 p.m., 2 p.m., you will hear, you will hear there is a message from Dr. Sarojji that what is raining there, what is problem there, is earthquake there. He is keeping us alive every time. I salute also the Sarojji. The, the, the interest he has taken, he has forced me to come here. I have a very important meeting. He did that, he did this, come and attend. But I am not happy, Joel, to speak like that while I have. Nah, while I have. Sir, Prize is very small, beautiful station. I think some of you have already visited. Some of you have not, have not visited. I welcome you all to visit Tipura, to see Tipura, is one of the finest states. Regarding disaster management, I have nothing to say. We have, the, we have heard the last three days the finest man, minds of, of disaster management. No? And we are beneficial for this program. Thank you to you all, sir. Serve it again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anindri, for your very encouraging remarks. Thank you for endorsing uh, positively what we have done in the last three days. And you were right that uh, Sarajji uh, and I'm sure other government officials of Tripura have very actively participated. And there have been some very interesting deliberations. Bahut, bahut interesting baate hui. Uh, Tripura ke perspective se bhi baat hui. Aur sirap Tripura ke liye nahi, pure India ke liye. I think jo experts ya hai, the good part is ki wahi virtual conference pe sabse achha fayda ye hota hai. Or mere ek bahut, uh, uh, you know, jo, jo, jo jude mein hamare saath people who are participating in this uh, online training program. Ki ye sab virtually bhi uploaded hai, live telecast ho raha hai YouTube pe. Or humne waha pe ja kar kal observe kiya, there were people from other countries who were also participating because of the speakers. The list of speakers we have, itne eminent speakers, is not an easy task. And I must thank uh, Professor Chandan Ghosh for the wholehearted effort, leadership he has shown, and his affection and love for the state of Tripura was very visible. I think uh, um, and I think uske liye jo effort Fikki bhi kar paya to organize this program. And uh, thank you for the leadership. Uh, which has been invited from the state of Tripura. My special thanks to Srimati Tanushri Dev Verma, 
special thanks to uh, Arindra ji, you, Sarat ji, and the entire team of, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, the, from the state of Gam uh, Tripura, who have been involved in, in agreeing in such a short time to participate as a partner to this uh, very important initiative. Bhot bhot shukriya aap sabka. And of course, the speakers hain, if we say that the OTP kitna successful hua, ye training program kitna speak, uh, successful hua, एक पैरामीटर तो ये है कि कितने अच्छे स्पीकर आए एंड आई एम श्योर बहुत सीखने को मिला जो जो जुड़ा उन्होंने बहुत कमेंट्स भी दिए वेरी पॉजिटिव कमेंट्स हैव कम आउट बट सबसे जरूरी चीज होती है कितने लोगों ने अटेंड किया वो भी एक इंपॉर्टेंट पैरामीटर होता है एंड आई एम हैप्पी टू शेयर विद यू ऑल्दो वी हैव 175 पीपल लॉग्ड इन राइट नाउ बट देयर वर ओवर 350 पीपल हु हैड रजिस्टर्ड एंड लॉग्ड इन एट डिफरेंट टाइम्स ड्यूरिंग द लास्ट 3 डेज व्हिच आई थिंक कंसिस्टेंटली uh been attended at uh, you know so uh, uh so actively is a great sign and is a sign of success so um, congratulations to uh, the tripura government for participating and for conduct of such a successful online training program over to you uh chandan sir uh yeah uh तो मेरा तो एक कनेक्शन तो है आ, तो <laughs> और इसमें वन थिंग इज आई वुड से दैट ऑल आवर एक्सेप्ट वन टुडे इन फैक्ट वी हैड फोर प्रेजेंटेशन प्रोफेसर भरत लोहानी इन फैक्ट ही हैज गॉन फॉर पुटिंग द सेकंड डोज ऑफ वैक्सीनेशन व्हिच ही हैज जस्ट गॉट just few minutes back so not in a position though i invited him to share his word but not in a position you know second shot is really every one of us who have taken and it keeps you off for a day or two uh, that indicates that it is effective body is taking up uh, that shot so uh, unfortunately he could not due to vaccination uh, for two more than two and half an hour he was on the queue so i was communicating with him otherwise you would have got him uh, but uh, otherwise all other speaker uh, all experts they have uh, shared uh, whatever they had in their mental uh, in their domain expert area and they have given everything for the society and so our coordination over here uh, sitting at different places different parts of the world uh, our uh, it is uh, our satisfaction is that yes we are able to reach uh, to the people uh, that which japan started in 1973 in case of robot which has come out in a drone form or mobile or best quality cars so uh, we would like to put uh, on record that yes uh, india is differently able in different directions spirituality or even uh, yoga and many things so swami vivekananda ji uh, uh, of course in his speech he says that scientific brain of the west and our in, uh, spirit of the east when they combine then really this art will be or this uh, sustainable development or this art will be really will be fulfilled so uh, now we are we are we, we have got such an occasion such a uh occasion of uniting with the brilliant minds on the earth that ever existed through this system that uh, so we see that uh, what we have delivered over uh, over online uh, and bringing all the experts that we could collect in a very short period of time uh, uh, but uh, i'm happy that uh, they have came up um, and to the right to rise to the occasion in the in the in the program that we have framed in this manner and whatever lacuna or whatever short communication that we could uh, give because it was not even 24 hours before we have to do at least i was sharing that more than 40 times i have to change my flyer or banner in in two days of time changing at the last minute that is also another kind of ability to adapt into the current ongoing uh, 
uh, exigencies that some of the speakers were facing because we only let them know only 48 hours before. So that kind of things, yes, we are able to handle. And yes, it is, uh, even though we are exceeding time every day, 4.30 was the calendar time, but we are exceeding yesterday out also up to six o'clock or even then, but it is called, uh, we are exceeding, but we are stretching our share of garnering knowledge from the, from the experts that who have assembled over here. So really salute to all of you, especially uh, Mr. Mukherjee from DRDO, uh, who took the leading lecture and, and also shared his, uh, uh, his uh, passion about the first project even way back in 2007. Of course, Sunandan talks about these things in 1973 onward, but here things start in 2007. So we are late, but rather never. So we are late, but not ever, but now with the kind of synergy of technology, know-how communication that uh, we are familiar with our younger generation, including not so young like me. So now they're, uh, and uh, so we are going to have a very fast uh, development in this area uh, and solving many of the things from the root and uh, using the, uh, wonderful human resource and technology capitals that available in the globe. So thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. And also like, for example, comparing like uh, whenever we see anything good thing around the globe, we always think whatever, what if, if we have this thing in our own country? Yeah. So, and, uh, but sometimes I believe that, uh, of course, competition leads to a kind of a following, like whenever we start competition without uh, thinking much, but uh, at one point of time, we start uh, following our competitor. So I, I think, I believe India gives more opportunity and more different variety of problems compared to other countries, as I believe, because of this variety of demography and variety of situations and all these deserts and Himalayan regions and the sea and coastal sites, various opportunities to deal with different tasks. So various uh, originalities are yet to come up in our own country. So I hope uh, for that and best wishes for you. And thank you, sir, for this uh, leading uh, present, uh, leading discussion and enlightening interaction at the end of each session. And thank you for your uh, opportunity. Thank you for your presence. Okay, uh, now we say that. Uh, I think, sir, we are getting a lot of comments also and requests from our uh, yeah. participants who are connected with us from all over the country and outside as well. Uh, Mr. Gupta from Lakshminagar, New Delhi, I think he's requesting for, uh, you know, copy of the PPTs. Uh, let me assure everyone who is yeah. present on this call, they'll get a copy of the presentation which would be uploaded on the NIDM, you know, right, along with the certificate as well. So please give us about seven to eight working days before the uh, certificates of participation are uploaded on the NIDM website. And that's where you can download those certificates, the certificate of participation. I think that is also something which uh, everyone is very keen to know about. Uh, we were, uh, we got an email short while back from, uh, former chief secretary i okay. think uh, i'm yeah. just trying to check if he could Mr. sign Pandey? in because uh, Akhil, uh, do we have any update from because i think we, we just shared the yes yeah. i received the mail from mr sanjay panda so i have responded back uh to him uh he was asking for the link to join so i have responded back around uh Half an hour back, but uh, I did not see him uh, online. So I don't know uh, uh, because we I can, think he's out of New York. Yeah, but I'm, is it possible that he's on on the attendees list? No. Uh, we are just uh, quickly checking. I don't think uh, so perhaps because he's in US, and I I think he's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I cannot see him in the attendee list as well. Uh, 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 he's based out of New York, I guess. So 
I don't know whether it is a convenient time for him, but uh, I had responded back to uh, him. Uh, so, oh, yeah. so, I So uh, I think we have his best wishes. He he wanted to uh, be a part of uh, this conversation, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't know if he's. We don't have his contact details. I think uh, uh, Mr. Prusty had it. So uh, I hope he was would have seen the email where we have sent him the link again. But uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh, we, we we I think we are good to to conclude. Uh, Varun, if you could just quickly check uh, with uh, Dr. Ahmed. He was also keen. Dr. Ahmed is again a former member of the National Disaster Management Authority, Government of India, who, uh, who was uh, part of the uh, uh, panel and listening panel. In fact, he was also uh, uh, listening to the speakers, the eminent speakers throughout the three days. He had a meeting which was clashing with the validatory session. So uh, we would just quickly check if he could possibly come. Any final comments from uh, 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 Akhil yourself? If you would like to say anything or Mainak on the um, on, on on this, uh, and and thank you so much, uh, Anindya ji, for the open invitation to visit Tripura. I think uh, we soon, as we have planned, that we know we will get into a formal understanding uh, with uh, NIDM, Fiki, and uh, government of Tripura, and continue. To work closely together to in, in the area of disaster risk management and other areas also wherever Tripura thinks uh, you know Fiki can contribute. Akhil, what do you any anything any any comments you would like to make? Uh, yeah, Bob. So uh, we have had excellent three days of presentations from very eminent yeah. speakers. So we've, we've, in the entire process, we've ended up learning so much and. Uh, drones is uh, one of those things that this, uh, the, the application area is immense. Uh, the potential is immense. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we should continue to work in this direction. And as rightly uh, mentioned by all the eminent panelists and speakers, you know, uh, we should, uh, 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 you know, collaborate and, and work towards uh, implementing such solutions wherever required so, so that, you know, for, for being better prepared for eff efficient relief and response and many other things. So I must say that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, as you say that uh, three days very well spent and we've uh, def definitely ended up learning uh, so much over here. Thank you. Thank you, Akhil. Manak, any concluding remarks from your side? I think, uh, Rubab, it has been a very wonderful, you know, presentation and this three day deliberations was really nice because we had a lot of present, we have seen a lot of presentations on drones and applications on drones on different sectors. We had uh, the new applications, you know, which we have seen like uh, use of drones in the medical sector. And then we have a presentation from the bio group, you know, who said that they wanted to look into forward to projects uh, with uh, the government and uh, it's mutually beneficial for all the stakeholders. So I think uh, there's a lot of learning which went on through and uh, it was really wonderful and to know a lot of new things also and to also understand that in the future, uh, the application of drones and the type of you know impact it will have also in the Indian economy and the finances and also on the disaster management. So really wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you. I think uh, the last three days were very well spent. Uh, over to you, Dr. Uh, Ghosh, for your final comments before we conclude the session. Sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I have said enough. I think more than enough. <laughs> so uh, I think on, on, on that note, to all the participants, to all the dignitaries, all the speakers who are with us right now and who were with us in the past two days, a, a big thank you from FIKI CIDM board and NIDM. Uh, 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 and yeah. of course, um, uh, our sponsors, uh, Crop Science Division of the Bayer Group, and uh, our partners, Government of Tripura, from all of uh, all the partners who have organized, uh, come together to organize this OTP. A big thank you again to all the participants. Uh, it was it was a I, I could conclude that you know it was a wonderfully organized. Uh, 
a well uh, uh, conducted i think program i'm not trying to praise what we did but i just want to make sure that uh, there was enough learning and if there were any if there's any feedback where uh, the audience thinks that we can improve as organizers we would we would always uh, welcome those feedbacks uh, those inputs because that those are the inputs which help us improve in in our forthcoming programs so uh, Okay. That's also mentioned by Dr. Ghosh. Um, you know, COVID has been a, a big uh, setback for to a lot of people. Has been a great learning curve to 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 many. We have learned a lot during these last two years. We have we have gained a lot. People have lost a lot. So have we. I think we are all together in this. But I think the biggest contribution which we can do to 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 help the society and the community get rid of covid is to get vaccinated so whoever qualifies to for for vaccination i think it is a no brainer we should not think twice but to get vaccinated as soon as we can because that is the best way to defeat covid uh, for our own self for our families for our communities so please uh, uh, make sure everyone uh, and and be ambassadors whoever gets vaccinated should become an ambassador to convince others who are not to get vaccinated as soon as they can so I think on that note, uh, big thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us, sparing time, spending three quality days with us. Uh, until next time, from FIKI, NIDM, uh, Bayer Group, yeah. and of course, most importantly, the government of Tripura. Bye-bye and thank you. Thank you so much, Sarajee. Thank you.